end of the uh, January meeting, uh, um. I'd like to appreciate your comments. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Selamat siang, Ibu Riris. Selamat siang, Awi. Hoi. Hi, I'm good, I'm good. So it is the time, yeah? Mm. If are you ready, Pak? Then we can start. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, and welcome to the public discussion discussing about the future of East and Southeast Asian cooperation for protecting the rights of migrants, which is focusing on the roles of civil society. This event is being organized by Human Rights Working Group, Sasakawa Peace Foundation, and BBC. BBC stands for Better Engagement Between East and Southeast Asia. It's an online movement building initiatives to exchange information and resources, as well as discussions on the rights of migrants and their families across East and Southeast Asia. This public discussion aims to explore possibilities to have a cross-regional cooperation between two regions, which are East and Southeast Asia, especially in protecting the rights of migrants. So in this occasion, we are really privileged to have amazing speakers here participating with us. And to start off, we're going to be hearing the welcoming remark from Mr. Itsu Adachi, the Executive Director of Asian Programs of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. Mr. Itsu Adachi, the screen is yours. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. My name is Itsu Adachi, Executive Director of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. Thank you for joining us today at the strategic planning meeting entitled The Future of East and the Southeast Asia Corporation for Protecting the Rights of Migrants, the Laws of Civil Society. I'd like to warmly welcome all the participants and resource persons today, including Ms. Eni Restari of the International Migrant Alliance, Professor Nicola Piper of the University of London, and Dr. Dewey Adana Riswari Suridorijo, the University of the Ind Indonesia. In the past three years, Human Rights Working Group and the Sasaka Peace Foundation have conducted its studies about four cri cri critical issues related to migration in Asia, uh, which are the first, the human rights situation toward migrants in ASEAN in the year 2019, Secondary, the stay behind children in Myanmar, Indonesia, and the Philippines in 2020. The departure process processes of Indonesian migrant workers up to Japan, published in 2020. And lastly, the COVID-19 of migrant workers in destinations in 2020. Today's online meeting is to discuss cross-regional cooperation between East and Southeast Asia with the foremost experts and civil society organizations based on the four studies. I'd like to express our sincere gratitude to Mr. Muhammad Hafiz and Daniel, Mr. Daniel Aligra and Mr. Lafendi Jamin and the team members of the Human Rights Working Group for their trust and partnership with us and their professional and dedicated works. I'd like to appreciate experts and practitioners too, who participated in the four studies. Their contributions made the research rich and persuasive and rooted in the voice of migrants. Just 10 years ago, uh, East, East, East Japan uh, hit it by the, the, this very serious, the big the mega quake and tsunami. And the, the same day, the one year ago, the, today, it's in the March 11th, 2020, World Health Organization declared the, the coronavirus pandemic. So I'd like to, uh, in this question, I'd like to express the, my sincere condolences to the victims of the Thatcher natural, natural disasters. Uh, since the same day, the last year, 
the borders across the land world, the people's movement and economic, social and economic and social activities are severely restricted. Everything surrounding us has changed dramatically. In Japan as well, migrant workers, including technical intern trainees and international students, have been restricted for, from entering and leaving the country since last spring. Those migrants have stranded in the both of Japanese side and the sending countryside. Business opportunities, planning to accept migrant workers suffered from labor shortages. Migrant workers, many of who are not non-regular workers, face a difficult situation in, the lives, in their lives due to the drastic salary cuts and layoff. These situations were well, wake up call to make us recognize how our convenient lives, societies, economies, and industries have very critically relied on the migrant workers. How migrant workers have been placed institutionally and structurally vulnerable situation, and how its economic, economic and social costs have been put on migrant workers and their families. Do we overlook this situation? Or can we make this crisis an opportunity for change? When we face a crisis situation, such as a pandemic, people tend to fall into thinking their own country first and their own people first. And such responses have been seen all over the world. However, I'd like to believe that Asia has a potential to overcome this crisis by strengthening its robust social capital and networks while respecting this diversity and the inclusiveness and helping each other. I think the proof is that everyone of you gathered here today. The problems associated, associated with the international migration cannot be solved by person, one person and one organization and one country. However, if the stakeholders across the region bring with them and work together, it will be possible to change it even little by little. The Sasagawa Peace Foundation will do its at most to contribute to the improvement of migration problems in Asian countries. And at the same time, consider the responsibility of Japan as an emerging destination country. I hope that today's discussion will be a major step forward, strengthen the platform for dialogue between key stakeholders in the East and Southeast Asia, and stimulate discussion on this issue and solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Itsuanachi. So we have learned that due to this pandemic, especially uh, migrants are in a very vulnerable um, situation. And we hope um, many people can join to uh, you know, improve um, the quality of protection in, uh, for migrants. Um, Especially in this case, is between East and Southeast Asia. Okay, thank you very much for once again for the welcoming remark. And now it's time to move into the main session. So I'll be handing over the event to Miss Mariko Hayashi. Miss Mariko, uh, the screen is yours. Thank you, Pat. Um, good afternoon to probably most of you, but good evening or good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Mariko Hayashi, and I'm the moderator of this panel today. Um, I'm a board director of Southeast and East Asian Center, but I am also a former program officer of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. So I have been very privileged to continue engaging with this initiative in my individual capacity with the Human Rights Working Group and the Sasakawa Peace Foundation. So today, um, I'd like to start by introducing all our panel speakers first. Um, so first of all, we are very delighted to be joined by Ms. Eni Lestari, the chairperson of International Migrant Alliance. She's a Hong Kong-based prominent migrant rights activist with an extensive experience in leading grassroots community organizing, as well as migrant-led international advocacy work. 
And we also have uh, with us today, Professor Nicola Piper, who is currently based at Queen Mary University of London. Uh, she is an expert in global governance of labor migrations and global advocacy politics. And she has extensively engaged with the civil society advocacy network uh, at the regional and international level, especially in the context of Asia. Uh, the third speaker is Dr. Dewey Aldenasriwari Sundurijo. Um, let me call you Ibu Iris. Um, she is a lecturer at the Department of International Relations at University of Indonesia, and today will tell us about the regional and transnational approach to human rights, as well as role of civil societies in effective engagement regionally. And lastly, uh, we have Mr. Daniela Wigra, the Deputy Director of Human Rights Working Group, uh, who will share with us their experiences of ASEAN CSO advocacy for human rights and its expansion to the cross-regional um, initiative between East and Southeast Asia and opportunities for further strengthening this cooperation. Um, so yeah, let's move on and we will start with um, if any, uh, please the Zoom is yours. So have my, I have a few slides of uh, PowerPoint to guide, but before that, I would like to thank HRWG for inviting uh, International Migrants Alliance to have this kind of uh, sharing with all of you today, especially Daniel for always uh, talking with me in terms of what the needs of the migrants in Asia. So this is very uh, timely opportunity for all of us to really discuss what is the future of migrants and the advocacy of migrants rights, especially in Asia. So bear with me, I will have to go through a little bit about the context of Asia. In, in general, before I go to into the detail of what is the current situation of migrants during the pandemic, and what would be the really the challenges that we have to prepare uh, during and post uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, hold on, I don't know how to make it big oh, here. So uh, before I move to East Asia, and Southeast Asia, let me just go through about, uh, you know, exploring about the reality of uh, Asian migration. Uh, Asia is actually a home for 40% of the world population. Uh, it's very rich in natural resources with long history of colonialization and no colonialization. I, the reason why I mention this because the type of migration we have in the past up to now is really shaped by the type of colonization and new colonization that exists in our region up to now. And migration to and from Asia is very diverse, dynamic and has wide reach, consisting of sending, transiting and even receiving countries. So Asia has all. Uh, and we are the biggest uh, resource uh, countries for all uh, contractual labor for international cooperation and also source for skilled workers, especially from China, India, and Filipina. Asia Pacific hosts 20.4% uh, 20 or 68 million with high portion uh, in Arab uh, states. So in the world today, in 2017 or 2019, the world population of migrant workers is 160 million and 20% actually are living in, in Asia. And the type of migration we have in Asia is primarily temporary migration regime through the system of outsourcing, which means government are using the services of private agencies to recruit people and deploy. But also there is another type, which is government to government, which is in the case of Indonesia and Japan, for example. And also the type of employment, mainly uh, we call it a basic or medium skill, uh, which is covering domestic worker, caregiver, construction, entertainment, manufacture, textile, fishing, and others. So particularly, I'm going to... Uh, discuss the migration in East and Southeast Asia. When we say East Asia, which is uh, covering China, Japan, Mongolia, North Korea, South Korea, and Taiwan, and Southeast Asian, this is the list of countries uh, belong to, are also ascending, transiting, and receiving countries, which including receiving migrants from South Asian countries like India, Pakistan, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. We see them a lot, either in Hong Kong, in, in Taiwan, in in, in uh, uh, even in in Korea, 
uh, in Singapore, many of the migrants from South Asia are also working in this uh, region. ASEAN recorded 9.9 .9 million international migrants are coming from this uh, region, while 6.9 million have moved within countries within the region. Nearly half of uh, migrants are women, uh, and among those women, 30% of women migrants in Malaysia and Thailand are girls. It's between 15 to 24 years old and with low education. And also huge number of undocumented migrants uh, because of the unbearable uh, working condition and very repressive immigration policies. Many countries, many source countries uh, in Asia are also increasingly dependent to the remittances of migrant labor. So what are the regulation and protection that is offered by uh, home host countries in Asia, sorry, in, in Southeast Asia and East Asia to migrant workers in general? So the first is uh, most migrants uh, are not being covered by minimum wage legislation if there is an excess one in that country. And we are paid lower than local worker with no social benefit and protection. Uh, in, in our uh, random survey, most of the migrant workers usually receive one third of the local wage of the local labor. And in terms of labor protection, few are included in the labor ordinance of receiving countries. For example, in the case of Hong Kong for domestic worker, factory and sea workers in Taiwan, factory workers in Korea. But most migrants are excluded from any legal protection of that country. What does it mean? So that means that country do not provide any standard contract with standard basic rights, which include rest day, annual leave, maternity leave, and other type of rights, which is very important for migrants in general and more important for women migrants. Even if there is a, they are given so-called right, especially those country that is not uh, included their migrants in the labor ordinance, uh, the, the, the amount of the rights given is really depend to the kindness of the host government and depends to the bilateral agreement between that country and our home country. So in many cases, we can see like Filipino migrants will have more holiday than Indonesian, but Indonesian migrants still have once a month holiday compared to other Cambodian, Vietnam, or even other uh, Nepalese, for example. So this is really uh, becoming uh, indirectly become a competition of labor uh, in, in many uh, host countries because either employers, company, and government are recruiting migrants based on this type of degrading right. So less rights means more employer will hire, more rights means employer will be very, very picky. And also, uh, Migrant workers, uh, they are also not being covered by the labor ordinance in their own home countries. So within our home countries, we are not even recognized as part of so-called workforce. Uh, therefore, there is no legal protection even in our home countries. And even if there is one, uh, they create special policy or laws only for migrant workers. And usually, it really lack of recognition to rights and mechanism of access to complaint and remedies. For example, when there is cases of violence in other countries, whenever we have to go home, there is no way for you to even file, uh, continue filing case against employer or companies in that uh, overseas because this kind of uh, situation, there is no mechanism for that. And uh, even it's very difficult for us to file cases against private agencies and trafficking traffickers in our home countries. And also migration in Asia, is highly regulated and controlled, not only regulated, but highly, highly controlled through restrictive immigration policies, like including through visa uh, restriction. For example, they only give six months visa, one year or two years, but once you lose the job, you are not allowed to stay. You have to leave that country. Even you are allowed to enter again, but you have to leave that country. Only very particular cases, you then they will be allowed to stay. For example, in the case of Hong Kong, unless your employer die or your employer uh, bankrupt or maybe move out to other countries, then there is no way for you even to change employer if you lose the employment less for less than two years. 
and also type of employment is very particular. You cannot move from one job to other type of job. In the, in the case of Marco, for example, once they are entertainment, they have to find another job in the, in the same type of visa arrangement. They cannot just move up and down according to their condition that they face the time. Even residential address is very particular. For the, manda, for the domestic worker in Asia, mainly, mainly is a live-in domestic worker. So that actually the reason why uh, when we say border control, unlike in the case in the US where they create a wall just to stop people entering, in Asia when we say border control or securitization of migration is really through uh, imposition of immigration policies and how they also make sure that migrant workers do not have the right to mobility even within the, the country and all the more across the countries. That actually really increased the number of people who are forced to be undocumented. And yet when they are undocumented, all the more they will be continue to be exploited and very vulnerable. That's why many of the cases who are trapped into smuggling and even a human trafficking, drug syndicate, many of them are really migrants who are in this kind of situation. They are already vulnerable because of the employment condition, very harsh immigration policies, and yet they have no much option to even change job, uh, even type of employment, for example, or move to other countries without the need of paying so much fees and so much requirement. Another uh, regulation uh, that is existing is also no right to become permanent resident, neither flexibility to change job. So in my case, for example, I've been in Hong Kong for 20 years. There is no way for me to even work in other type of employment because once you are domestic worker, you will be forever there. Once you are this type of employment, you will be forever there. Yeah. So some countries are even imposing a quota uh, for for how many years you can stay in that country. Although now this kind of quota has been criticized strongly, but somehow the government finding a way to make sure that you can never have eligibility to even file a case to be a permanent resident. In the case of Hong Kong, for example, they make sure we have to leave Hong Kong within two years, even that is for only two weeks or one week, because under the law, if you leave Hong Kong, uh, physically, that means you cannot file any um, uh, in the court to file a, a, to be a permanent resident here. And also no maternity protection and supporting, supporting system, especially for women migrants. Few allows right to form union or join the union, but with many, many, many restrictions. You cannot talk political, you can only talk about migrants' rights, you know, economic rights, but you cannot talk anything beyond that. And most uh, countries even are being banned or prohibited. So practically, they even have no a way to even express what they are grievances, but also there is no way for, either, for them to even gather together and have a bargaining power or collective right. And also no right to participate in national election of that country. That's why uh, in many cases, uh, politicians do not really care uh, what are the realities of migrants. They don't really want to fight for policy reform. And uh, sadly, in many countries, uh, because many of the voters are also employers or even companies, uh, many of these politicians, especially the right-wing politicians, are using uh, more proposal, anti-migrant proposal to gather more votes from the employers that really prom uh, prominent when it comes, for example, in Hong Kong. So what are the working and living condition uh, within that kind of macro situation? So on the ground, we can see in terms of our accommodation for most uh, caregiver domestic worker, they have to live in with their employer houses, no matter how small the house is, whether they have to sleep on the floor, whether they have to sleep even inside the cabinet or even in the rooftop. And those who wait uh, factories, for example, factory workers, many of them are sleeping in the crime and overcrowded boarding houses. And many of the fact, um, farmer or, or farm workers, they have to sleep in the in human huts, you know, like uh, places which is very far away from the cities. And this is the reason why COVID-19 become very um, easily spreaded among the, especially in the boarding houses. And many of them even died during the, you know, in the case of Korea, there was a migrant who, Cambodian migrant workers who died because of the cold, yeah, because they were not really enough protected. In terms of working hours minimum, 
uh, all migrants work at least 10 hours, which is not very, very common. In average, usually 12 hours, but some even all the way goes beyond to 18 to 20 hours uh, without rest. In terms of rest day, uh, no, or lack of rest day, countries who allow rest day, employer will still find a way or even companies will still find a way how to minimize. For example, for domestic worker, they can have 24 hour rest day, but then the employer will tell them cook first in the morning and then cook again in the evening. You practically only have maybe 12 hour rest or maybe eight hours only in a day. But again, this is countries that will allow rest day. What about countries without rest day? Then practically they cannot have rest day at all for the throughout the contract, two years, five years, you know, as long as they stay there. In terms of food, lack to decent and nutritious food, even when it comes to domestic worker who's supposed to have uh, access to food in the fridge. But in our survey, we found out that the issue with the domestic worker is lack of access to food itself, because employer will tell you what to eat and what not to eat. And most of us are overcharged by recruitment agencies, which lead to the issue of debt bondage. Uh, months, uh, at least our salary has, has to be sacrificed for six months minimum, some even all the way going to 15 months. If you keep losing the job, then you will have to pay fees throughout, sometimes even two or three years. And also that overcharging lead to confiscation of personal documents, both our passport and even our documents back home, and also denial to, ac uh, to access of legal information because the agency employer do not want us to know what are our legal rights. And also no protection of safety hazard, especially in the construction uh, and even farm workers, there is no proper you know, uh, safety net that is given to them. So death and injuries becoming very, very common lack of access to public spaces for rest, uh, especially for live-in uh, migrant domestic workers or caregiver. The only time they can go out is on Sunday. But again, because of this COVID-19, for example, a lot of public spaces has been closed, so they do not know where to go. And then whenever they gather, they will be scapegoat, discriminated, and even uh, stigmatized. And again, uh, imprisonment, arrest, imprisonment, and deportation is very common. So even without uh, COVID-19, this practice has been the practice in Asia. So what has been the life of us under the pandemic? So I can say that um, in terms of COVID-19, the issue really is all about lack of information. Most information is only available in English or even that uh, local language, maybe Chinese, for example. Uh, but there is none. You, that you can you cannot you can find you can hardly find it in our language and even if there is one it's very very minimum so a lot of migrants have to rely to social media to even uh, search for proper information about the covid 19 how to prevent it and so forth and the second uh, impact is really multiply in terms of harsh working condition and exploitation uh, if uh, working hours is already long now become longer now that school from home, work from home, making us cleaning the house at least three to five times a day. Cooking means uh, three times to seven times a day and, and many, many more. And also that really caused uh, us to have stress uh, phenomenon becoming very common, which is, uh, you know, from physical because of endless work, psychological because endless demand and financial because of no support uh, in terms of mass sanitizer, even finance or food, for example, we are forced to buy with our own money and our money is not that much, you know, to spend. So in our survey, we found out 10% of their income now has to be spent for all those kind of uh, extra expenses during this COVID-19. And also increase uh, uh, infection and death, uh, you know, I don't have to elaborate, you know, well, even in Malaysia, in, in Singapore, even in Hong Kong, there are really growing um, infection among migrants, especially in the boarding houses. And also more migrants are forced to take unpaid leaves and also termination. And a lot of job has been uh, denied. Uh, crackdown, arrest, deportation continue to happen. Malaysia has been doing that in the past one year during COVID-19, at least twice. And then uh, shrinking democratic spaces because of uh, social distancing and uh, prohibition in gathering. You, we practically cannot say anything, yeah? So, uh, and also deterioration of labor rights. Uh, holiday is a problem. Even our own uh, leaders, you know, among the union leaders, some even are not even uh, given holiday in the past six months, seven months. 
something like that. So employer always using this COVID-19 to say you cannot go out. If you go out, I will terminate you. So we are really torn between staying for the job or, you know, living, you know, fighting for our rights. And also lack of PPE, um, uh, protection assistance, and there is no financial subsidy, both coming from home countries, our own country, but even from host countries. When many government are actually giving away cash to their people, but uh, most migrants are excluded. And stigmatization and criminalization, uh, calling us uh, COVID-19 spreader, carrier, we are a breaker of the social distancing, we do not want to follow the law and so forth. It become very, very common sentiment among the local people who are also very, very uh, stressful. So what, what are our urgent call? Um, in IMA, we have been try we've been trying to formulate what are really uh, the message that we have we want the world to know. What do we want as a migrant workers on the ground that facing all these realities, difficulty, and so forth? The first thing is really inclusion. Uh, we don't like ex uh, exclusion, all the more discrimination in mass testing, vaccination, free medical free medical care, economic, food, and other form of relief. If they give to others, why not to us? We also contribute to the local economy in host countries, but yet when there is a relief, we are forgotten at all. We also want the government to stop the arrest, detention, deportation of undocumented migrants, and please give them amnesty and regular, regularization of migrants without any condition so they can access to job, services, protection, and other uh, aid that is given by government. Release the detained migrants, especially those who are elderly, sick, and those who are at risk, at risk of the infection. Provide comprehensive assistance for the stranded migrants, including food, shelter, free ticket to go home. Provide significant livelihood assistance to those who are being deported back home, regardless of our immigration status. So again and again, we reiterate that whether you are documented or undocumented, we contribute equally to countries of destination and even our home countries. Even we are undocumented, we still have to send money back home. Even we are undocumented, they still have to work in home, uh, host countries to be able to support our family back home. So there is no there is no differentiation between uh, documentation or undocumented, you know, uh, when it comes to contribution. So government should not discriminate based on this kind of immigration status. And also provide temporary accommodation for migrants in need and free and decent quarantine facilities. This become a common complaint among the local employers because they also are being... Um, um, you know, they are also being burdened by these uh, expenses during the COVID-19. And now with this uh, quarantine uh, mandatory, employer have to pay more money just to hire workers. So we are calling the government, why don't they give us all these quarantine free facilities? And it, it will ease the pain of the employer, but also it make us at ease because it doesn't have to be conflict between the worker and the employer. And also open public park venues for migrant domestic worker or caregiver to rest on Sunday. Stop stigmatization and protect migrants from any xenophobia attacks. At this time, we are actually calling government. There should be a special, special hotline given to the migrant workers who have a lot of inquiries, you know, regarding this COVID-19, even complain, including all those uh, discrimination, you know, even physical attack, you know, or verbal attack. But we do not know whom to call. You know, you cannot call the police. They will ignore you anyway. You cannot call the labor department because they are closed on Sunday. So we are actually criticizing how the mechanism to serve the migrant community in host country are really, really in, in, ineffective to address the need of the migrant workers. Now, during the pandemic, all those kind of ineffectiveness become very, very feasible. And also, uh, our home government, whether Philippines, Indonesia, Bangladesh, uh, sorry, uh, other countries like uh, Thailand, have to reduce the fees, which is very unnecessary and burdensome, that create more burden for us in time of crisis like this. So the last urgent call is also to uh, demand the government to commit themselves to the rights of migrants and our family that they already signed in according to the UN Convention, ILO Convention, and now there is Global Compact for Migration and stop weaponizing COVID-19 to attack human rights of migrants. So we see this kind of trend, which is using COVID-19 to really attack migrants and so, you know, to some extent refugee. So how we 
look at you know as a grassroots movement how we see our way forward this time is very difficult but we believe that post covid-19 it will be more difficult for us even the 2008 global crisis already give us so much burden but we believe with this covid-19 it will be multiply again but then again as a poor people as a woman, as a migrant who are breadwinner of our family, what choices do we have? We cannot just go home and do nothing while our family now also increase in terms of needs because of, you know, all those expenses to buy phone card and so forth, you know. So every migrant is trying our best to survive abroad, regardless of our immigration status. So we, we, we expect there will be more increase in number of people who choose to be undocumented if government insists of deporting them regardless of their need. So then we, and yet we also face this kind of very harsh working condition that will diminish, erode our rights in the process of you know exploitation. But then again, as a unionist, as an organizer, the only way forward is really to continue organizing. We believe in the power of organization because we proved that many and many times again, even during COVID-19, who help us? Who? It is the migrants who are gathering the mass sanitizer. We are the one appealing to the local. We are the one who gather donation from everywhere in the world just to help our sister and brother on the ground. We are the one gathering food, so we, we can give away to we can give food to hunger migrants. And of course, the second role that we cannot deny is really the role of supporter. Pandemic really teach us that the solidarity from the local is really really undeniable. Without them, we do not know really what to do. They are the one helping us to gather all those logistical needs. They are the one uh, helping us translate, translating a lot of information. They are also helping us to inform about the new update on COVID-19 and policies and many things, even advocacy. So this unity among migrants and solidarity with the local become the key of for us to face the pandemic, but even the post pandemic. So the organizing it's really meant to address the immediate need of migrants and refugee. How disseminate information become the key. It is the main expenses, even in the grassroots organization like us, also gathering relief from mass, food, you know, and other type of needs that they need at this point. Also defending our rights through legal assistance, paralegal assistance, shelter, even safe repatriation. This become immediate need become our center of gravity, but also our point of organizing and unifying our forces. But beyond that, we also see that while we have to fight this immediate need, we still have a homework of continue to fight inclusion and equality in receiving countries, and also how to make sure our home countries will create employment, uh, development that is genuinely create job for the people because we do not know until when we can stay abroad. We just do not know when the government will say enough of migrants, send them all back home. So what's, what's going to happen with us? So this become our big and perhaps the biggest challenge. So the question that is posted to Ima is how can the supporter advocate continue to support migrants and migrants rights, um, uh, uh, defending migrants rights. So there are several points, but I believe there are more that later we can explore. The number one is really direct relief program. This is, I can say, mandatory. At this point, migrants need uh, food and mass and immediate thing. Before you can talk about advocacy, talk to them first about their immediate need. Without this, then they will not even talk to you. So that's why we are appealing to all supporter, uh, regional, international, uh, NGO, even funder, please give more uh, budget for this kind of direct relief programs, you know, so it can take a different type of forms depending to the area or countries, you know, or particularity of that migrants. The second is le uh, legal, financial and shelter assistance. Uh, while the government really ignore, they don't really accommodate our needs. And a lot of migrants out there really need spaces to sleep, you know, because they lost a job, they cannot pay rent, or maybe they have to look for another new job, so they have no place to stay. So this kind of assistance is really, really crucial. Even financial assistance, giving them money to buy food, to extend their visa, and so forth. Uh, the third is really storytelling and testimonies as we are appealing to our local friends. If you want to help migrants, talk to us, but also write our stories so the local will understand that we are also suffering. 
not only the local people suffering, not only people everywhere suffering, migrants also suffering. And, and our suffering is really hidden within the wall and within factories and within within our our you know employment. We cannot just express it because we have no time even to write our own story. So please help us to, to express that kind of messages. And research for policy reform and change in attitude. So the question is what kind of research that we need at this point? Any research that will change the policies that I already mentioned, that means promote inclusion in the labor ordinance and other type of uh, policies that exist in, in host countries and even home countries, but also please help us to make a research that will change attitude of government, but also the people itself, you know. Then the people itself, uh, whether in home or host countries, they really need a lot of education to know who we are, not only using our labor and remittances for the economic benefit you know so this is something that we really need um, at this point advocacy at national uh, bilateral uh, between two government even multilateral and 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 so forth as i said there are many many type of assistance you can lend depending to your um, capacity and now there are more people who also interested in photography it's okay anything you know students are interested to even write story of their nanny or caregiver it's okay anything that help to promote harmony and unity that is good so in terms of uh, planning since we are discussing in the next two days uh, plan in terms of advocacy for migrants in asia this is several aspect we have to put in mind, perhaps to explore further, is the, the fact that the, the global crisis is really getting worse. That means uh, job opportunity abroad is going to be less. And then yet the poverty back home is going to be worse. So how, how, it, how it looks like people will have difficulties in finding a job abroad and yet staying at home is not even a solution at all. And then the second is also economic agreement between governments, uh, you know, like we believe that where investment goes uh, that where also the migration of people flows you know so that means we have to pay attention to this kind of economic agreement between countries so we can maximize that for advocacy and even policy reform ASEAN we have to really discuss what to do with this ASEAN there is a, supposed to be blueprint for migrants but we really do not know where is it now how it can be useful to protect migrants the global compact on migration is still under review which is uh, in the past two days up to tomorrow uh, and next year there will be another gcm a four years review in new york that's i think we have to also bring the issue of migrants in asia uh, into the table and many others uh, factors that we have to consider yeah so i, I hope i give a general platform about the reality of migrants in Asia and also uh, what do we wish, uh, how you can support our uh, issues, but also our uh, protection of our rights in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it was very, very comprehensive presentations and knowing the backgrounds and the, the problems that until happening now and the pandemic. OK, so um, let's move on. And I would like to invite uh, Professor Nicola um, to speak for us when um, ready. Can you hear me? And yes, we can yes. hear you. Um, is this a screen? Yes, is any I, screen? Or is it your screen? I didn't prepare PowerPoints. Um, That's fine. Keeping it sort of flexible. Um, I think we are seeing. We, it. I think we are seeing any, any, can you stop sharing your screen? Um, looks beautiful. Do I, am I not? <laughs> yeah, it looks good. There you go. Thank you. Uh, it's very beautiful flowers. Um, allow me, allow me to start um, by paying tribute to a um, fantastic um, advocate uh, because I understand we have uh, colleagues from Malaysia here with us and uh, from Tenaganita. So I wanted to um, pay tribute to AJ Fernandez who sadly passed away a couple of days ago, joining her sister in hopefully a better place. Uh, the reason why I wanted to pay uh, tribute to AJ is I have such fond memories of sitting in their house, uh, you know, uh, discussing migration uh, issues while being offered some fantastic 
fantastic Malaysian delicacies. And I learned so much from her and her sister and never stopped being in awe of those two enormously courageous sisters. So I just wanted to start by paying tribute. And next, I would like to thank Daniel and his team for inviting me to this um, event. It's a great honor to share this panel with my fellow speakers. And I'm particularly delighted to be in e-company with Amy, um, whom I saw in action for the very first time many years ago, probably 15 years ago in Hong Kong, when she and others were leading the protest against the impending wage cuts for foreign domestic workers. And then again, I heard uh, Amy deliver an awesome speech at the second high-level dialogue of in at, in at the United Nations in New York in September 2013 where she, you know, gave a very loud and clear message, you know, do not talk about us without us, you know, and this is exactly, I guess, what um, this meeting here today is, is all about. Um, I guess to me, as an, as an academic researcher who takes an interest in advocacy politics and global governance of migration from a rights-based um, perspective, um, and as someone who really has followed very closely the way in which migration policy um, has been approached and institutionalized at the UN level since the early 2000s, you know, after the then UN General Secretary Kofi Annan declared, decided to declare migration as one of the key global challenges. Um, which really demonstrates exactly what civil society organizing and advocacy is all about, you know, bringing the voices and concerns of ordinary migrants to the attention of power holders and elites involved in national governments and also global governance, you know, international organizations who otherwise rarely directly engage with those most affected by migration policies and these um, governing frameworks which are being, you know, designed. So for someone whose main interest has always been labor migration and migration at the intersection of human and labor rights, and you know, obviously the cross-border movement of workers, men and women, I would say in relation to you know, what the key challenges are at the multilateral level today, is really generally speaking that um, there has been much more focus on governing migration, i.e. the movement of people across borders, rather than governing labor, by which I mean what is happening at the workplace. So the um, political focus by states really has been on managing um, the movement of people and securing borders uh, and immigration control, as Eni has pointed out. And with this also trying to manage poverty and access to labor markets. However, neglected is really the governance of workplaces and the hiring on working conditions of migrants in those sectors where migrants are predominantly deployed. And Amy has given us a wonderful outline of you know, what these sectors are. And this is reflected also in the use of government resources. You know, much more money is being spent on border control or immigration control than, for example, labor inspection mechanisms. You know, even in the, in, in the so-called rich global north, we hardly see any money spent on labor inspection. It's quite shocking. And the focus on migration management has led to the mantra uh, emanating from these global processes, you know, the call for regular pathways for migration. And this is also indicative uh, in the title of the global compact, Eni has already mentioned. And also, you know, in some of the uh, migration related SDG targets. But as we know from the experience in Asia, regular migration status alone is not a solution against labor rights violations and or the lacking access to services, um, which is also, by the way, borne out from the findings of a recent global survey of civil society um, advocacy uh, in the migration field, which has been carried out by the Women in Migration Network. And this global survey has found that um, of number one importance to most civil societies in the region is access to services and um, not necessarily access to documentation. And for those working on women in migration, the second most important concern is freedom from violence, you know, so gender-based violence and in the long term also addressing 
multiple forms of discrimination and uh, decent work, as Leni has also already said. So that regular status alone does not solve everything, is also reflected in bilateral labor agreements and memoranda of understanding, which are, as Amy has also already said, the most important tool for governing regular migration in Asia. So the, the language of these MOUs is, in, is again very managerial. You know, it's about quarters, deployment, but they don't contain any clauses on rights. And as a result, migrants, migrants might be legal, um, but they still don't necessarily have rights. Uh, and only because a mi migrant has a legal permit to enter and remain for a certain period of time does not shield her from being abused by her employer. So in fact, ironically, opting for an irregular status can in fact benefit migrants uh, in terms of seeking better working conditions, higher pay and so forth. So for me, one of the key challenges to promote better labor governance is not by just focusing on migration governance, but we need much more focus on, on, on labor governance, governance of what happens at the workplace. And this is a benefit um, and there is benefit in highlighting um, the need for better labor governance rather than just simply focusing on migration governance. And this lies in the possibility also to forge solidarities across workers by sector and not only by migration status and nationality. So the inability of migrants to obtain decent working conditions and to organize and bargain collectively has been used not only as a competitive advantage in global supply chains, but also to divide the, the working classes, if you like. And this has made it very difficult for trade unions, for example, to organize migrants, especially those who are on strictly temporary contracts and indebtedness and the need to earn an income throughout the short duration of their temporary um, uh, uh, contracts makes migrants buckle down and reluctant to lodge complaints and organize politically. Although we have seen the reverse also, which is great. Many more migrants do in fact uh, take up the struggle. What appears vital, however, is this enhancing of solidarity as Amy has also pointed out, not only among nationality groups, the different nationality groups of migrants and across uh, sectors, but also between migrants and local workers and to advocate for decent work for all workers. Now, of course, challenges can also be converted into opportunities. So the fact that migration has been declared a key global challenge can also be viewed as an important opportunity. And ever since the United Nations engaged in more concerted efforts to bring member states around the table, to discuss a common approach to migration and its regulation. Civil society organizations have also knocked on the door and demanded opportunities for meaningful participation. And this knocking, this knocking has become louder and it involves more and more civil society organizations. Because when I look back to the 1980s when the UN Migrant Worker Convention was negotiated, there were no civil society organizations involved at all. And now we not only have Northern international NGOs, but we have grassroots organizations and their networks from all around the world um, sitting uh, around the table and giving a voice and also supported increasingly by global trade unions. Now for Asia, the opportunity for effective advocacy is also partly divided, uh, provided by the very formalized manner in which migration is being regulated. So we have you know, concrete institutional mechanisms in place. There are actors involved which can be targeted, you know, whether it's ASEAN uh, or you know, rec recruitment agencies, there are bilateral agreements which can be critiqued, temporary migration schemes. Um, and all of these give us concrete entry points for advocacy. And civil society is, comparatively speaking, to other regions in the world, very well organized and organized also, you know, uh, in, uh, uh, across the ASEAN region and beyond ASEAN and also at ASEAN level, you know, and I'm thinking here also of the annual, might be biannual ASEAN um, civil society summit. Um, uh, at which I, I understand migration is uh, also figures quite importantly as a topic. 
Now, this institutional infrastructure is, um, you know, medium developed in terms of providing direct channels of access uh, for civil society. And there's probably much more lobbying that has to be done. Um, but what is super impressive in, in, in Asia is the, 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 the breadth of um, transnational networks, the, the networking between, um, uh, you know, countries of origin, countries of destination, um, and also the engagement, the increasing um, cross-sectoral engagement, you know, so civil society working on migrant rights issues, um, collaborating with um, general human rights organizations, women rights, um, and uh, increasingly climate change. Now, Southeast and East Asia as a region is also character is is very much characterized by a high level of um, association among migrants and um, the alliance building among very the, all these different organizations. Um, and uh, I guess what we might want to discuss and, and think about um, over the uh, next, um, you know, the remaining time is uh, how, how these different um, networks and groupings can be uh, made to speak to each other, um, collaborate maybe more efficiently, effectively, division of labor, you know, avoiding duplication of efforts and so forth. Um, so he, and also trying to, you know, make migration more of a mainstream issue across various different uh, issue areas, be it women's rights, climate change and so forth. And also organizing not only within migrant rights grassroots organizations, but also across, you know, with, with other types of organizations, be it lawyers across borders or, you know, all um, these other important um, civil society organizations. Now, on the issue of working with um, trade unions, I have mentioned the global trade unions, where we see really a lot of effort being paid, um, particularly, obviously, in sectors where migrants are particularly predominant. I know with regard to local and national uh, context, there is a variety of scenarios. There are many different experiences and unfortunately often not very positive. I know there is a lot of distrust among these diff uh, two types of um, groupings, the unions and migrant rights organizations. But there are also examples where important steps towards working with each other have been taken and they seem to be working. Um, and there are increasing examples of these alliances um, working more and more. The thing about the global trade union uh, confederations is they do have an enormous political power, uh, in particular in relation to the International Labour Organization, in relation to other uh, um, uh, big uh, organizations. And I'm thinking here, for example, of Qatar and FIFA World Cup 2022. So they've also, you know, lobbied uh, FIFA itself to think about its own responsibility in relation relation to uh, labor rights, you know, when handing out contracts to build um, the sports uh, uh, infrastructure in countries like Qatar and for the future, right? Um, so here in this, in this uh, sense, you know, unions are quite important allies and it might be quite good to think about, you know, how this collaboration can be improved and, 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 and how civil society grassroots organiza organizations can tap into um, the world of unionisms. The most vulnerable are, of course, still left out, you know, the in, in unorganized sectors such as fishing, uh, and there are many others. And But even there, we see increasing efforts being made to organize even the most vulnerable. And I'm thinking here of Taiwan, where this is an important initiative of, you know, organizing fishermen and seafarers and, 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 and joining, um, you know, building their own union or joining existing unions. So as far as political opportunity at this moment in time is concerned, these cross-sectoral alliances on climate change, women's rights, development, you know, economic justice um, are vital uh, to tap into. And I guess, um, you know, Amy has already, and I'm uh, uh, coming to an end here, has already alluded to this. This COVID pandemic has given us, I guess, one uh, opportunity, and this is there is more realization of how important universal social security is. And more countries are now beginning to really talk of universal uh, social security, not only in terms of healthcare, but also basic income. Um, as a result of, you know, what we've all just been through and still struggling with. Um, so here really might be an opportunity also to push for this, these very important universal rights and this whole idea of a basic income. So thank you very much for, you know, being here and listening to everyone. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to our discussion.
Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Nicola. Um, together with Annie's uh, presentation earlier, it's really important to see how all this grassroots and migrant-led work has been actually achieved so much to, to lay the grounds that where we are and how we can you know work together hand in hand uh, effectively. So that's probably the next two speakers can help us to kind of identify that area as well. So I'd like to move on to Ibrilis. I'm a bit aware of the time, but I think we it's important to hear uh, all what um, you've got to say. Yeah. Thank you, Mariko. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, Say hi. I would like to say hi to everyone. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, and then I would like to uh, say thank you to Daniel. It's a bit weird for me to say the word Daniel because because I always uh, um, I'm oh, oh, the first uh, when was it when we first time uh, when we first time met? Uh, what year was it? Uh, Fifteen years ago. <laughs> and since then, like since then, I I, I know him as uh, Awi, uh, not Daniel, and also Pae, uh, Mbak Yuyun, and uh, I, I saw several uh, other uh, familiar names. It's always good to be to get uh, to get invited by uh, higher wages, uh, like uh, coming back home every now and then. So thank you so much to uh, keep uh, inviting me in the, uh, 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 to talk in this forum. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm happy that uh, I got a chance to first to listen to Mbak Annie uh, and then Professor uh, Piper before I uh, I get to uh, uh, deliver what I want to what what I can deliver uh, because you know uh, Mbak Annie uh, talk uh, at a very micro level of. Uh, like uh, the real experience of the migrant, right? So the situation of the uh, 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 faced by, uh, by uh, real situation faced by the migrant, and so um, by any really list out what is the problem and and what are the things that we need to do. And uh, from uh, Professor uh, uh, Piper, from uh, I think I really learned about uh, how to put this. Uh, um, micro experience into like a structural context. We're talking about governance. We're talking about uh, uh, several uh, uh, different institutions. The last thing that um, mentions is about the the, the uh, labor organization. So it is very. Uh, I mean, it's it's really it's really important to put this very uh, what's a micro experience into a structural. Uh, 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 what to say approach and now uh, i'm not going to talk much about uh, things related to migrant itself but i'm going to talk about how civil society what civil society can do as part of the structure to deal with this very uh, uh, micro experience because civil society have access to structure and have also access to this uh, uh, very micro experience yeah, so what I'm going to share is uh, this is uh, uh, now uh, it's really based on my research, uh, uh, my, my PhD research on uh, the part, uh, on the part, uh, what's it, the contribution of civil society in Southeast Asia during the process of the establishment of uh, HR. So it's somehow related to uh, human rights issue, but I'm, I'm focusing more on the what the behavior of a civil society. So uh, I would like to do share screen if I'm allowed. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Model of civil society and regional human rights advocacy trends and uh, challenges. So the first time, uh, allow me to do this, uh, to go through this theor uh, theoretical justification. Why civil society? Why civil society uh, uh, in the region? And why, uh, why is it important, civil society roles in, in the region? Yeah, uh, referring to Morafsik and Munro, it is very clear that uh, to have human right issue discussed in a region uh, at, at the level of region is not at all at the interest of the states. Yeah, it is very clear from, from this uh, uh, two perspective. Yeah, no sovereign state would want to voluntarily agree to establish a regional watchdog institution. Yeah, 
because you know, uh, 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 for a sovereign state, they uh, they, they say that um, uh, anything related to human rights is a domestic issue. It is a, a domestic issue. It's a, uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's only like related uh, of like a matter between the government and whoever live in uh, in in their in their area of uh, authority and uh, and it has nothing to do with other uh, states outside of uh, their uh, their own uh, authority and regional uh, institution offer no obvious material benefits to the states involved so again in here we see that uh, uh, based on this theoretical uh, approach uh, we cannot really rely on government uh, government alone to deal with uh, uh, issue related to human rights. Uh, uh, also, in here related to uh, the rights of migrant worker, and because of that, uh, there is like a big hole that uh, that can be filled by civil society, right? Uh, my my research shows that uh, at least civil society uh, uh, in the, in ASEAN in Southeast Asia. The um, one, two, three, four, five, six. There are like a five uh, strengths of uh, civil society in 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 the region. They share certain goals and beliefs. They promote a, a perception of shared destiny and common interests. Have a relatively common understanding of the problem. Uh, uh, they work based on naturally based on uh, issue uh, oriented, and they have an agreement on the best way of addressing it. Why they have an agreement uh, on the best way of the best way of uh, address, addressing it? Because they, as as I said earlier, they have civil society uh, really have access to the grassroots, right? Uh, civil society really have access to uh, to directly hear from those who have uh, the experience. Like now we we hear we, just now we hear from the any. Uh, and we are willing to hear, to keep hearing from uh, 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 those who really uh, find pro a problem. And this is different from, for example, government. Yeah. And uh, other thing that is like a strength of civil society is the uh, ability to articulate, to promote perception of the world. So, so uh, not only they understand what happened at the at the street level, but but civil society uh, uh, have the ability to really put. Uh, what happened in context and really uh, 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 what to say uh, shut uh, really what to say talk about uh, what they think is real and uh, and is very articulative. Yeah, uh, their work is triggered by democratization from below. This is in Southeast Asia, and this democratization from below regionally links uh, people's movement and other voluntary uh, uh, organizations. Yeah, so uh, in this region, at least in Southeast Asia. Uh, uh, our historical background is uh, similar, uh, our interest is similar, our understanding of ASEAN is similar, and our uh, uh, word of, uh, uh, and our, uh, what's it, dreams and our ways of what ASEAN should do, uh, how regional, uh, uh, how regionalization should go, uh, is more or less similarly similar. Yeah. And um, my research uh, identify uh, uh, two ways of how civil society try to reach the ideal, right? Uh, how civil society try to uh, really work uh, 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 to to uh, how to say to overcome problems uh, uh, at the grassroots level. Yeah, first, civil society can be an activist. Civil society is, a, is an activist, it's an ex activist, right? The goal is to shape a wider public opinion. Yeah. And the strategies as an activist, the strategies is to do public awareness campaign and then to do media advocacy, basically to make a, a, a people audience, wider audience uh, understand what is the problem and what's wrong with our government. Yeah. Uh, apart from being an activist, uh, civil, our civil society in, uh, in ASEAN also uh, uh, be a lobbyist. Also, they also uh, play a role as lobbyists because they also have access to government. We also have access to government. Yeah. Uh, the goal uh, as a lobbyist, the goal is to shape the, the 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 mind of policy policy maker and then to influence the policy uh, uh, the, pro, the the policy making process. Yeah. Uh, and, and to do this, uh, uh, generally, they, uh, my research showed that uh, we can go through uh, three ways. First is via think tanks, who naturally have like a better relations with a policymaker. Uh, 
directly to directly talk to the institution like for example um, we, we cannot we, uh, civil society indonesia uh, can talk directly to asean or via like personal approach to the uh, to the regional institution so so in this case we see that you uh, civil society really have access both to the people and also to the elites yeah and and that's and that's the power of civil society um, in general yeah uh, so based on that uh, we have this identification i mean i, I would like to borrow from um, uh, makito what is civil society in asean yeah civil uh, civil society in asean typically composed by dedicated individuals so that is very important dedicated individuals with professional knowledge and experience and expertise in certain uh, in certain fields yeah and they're they, they're basically capable of delivering almost everything in response to the government yeah to support the government to to what to say to uh, critics uh, the government to provide what government wants like for example a policy recommendation ideas information uh, uh, and and this and that and everything is um, uh, uh, is really in line with their characteristic activities modes of conduct and missions they're, they're, they're capable of nurturing sense of community across national boundaries in varieties of ways. So this is the characteristic, uh, the characteristic of civil society in ASEAN in general. Yeah. So now for the for the uh, uh, to put this into context, because uh, I know that the strategic planning meeting is uh, to build cooperation between civil society in Southeast Asia and East Asia. Uh, this morning, I do a very brief research on how is it civil society in Asia. I mean, I have to really uh, let's say uh, say that I'm not an expert in in civil society in East Asia. But this morning, I, I do a very brief uh, research, and I found this. Yeah, uh, historically speaking, uh, uh, from what I found, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, civil society in East Asia is uh, what is it uh, established based on democratization process that is come from above yeah uh, civil society in asia uh, uh, really involved in national politics but still have like a, 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 a minimum attention to regional problems yeah but at least in here we know uh, that yes uh, sasako foundation really have uh, uh what to say attention to what happened uh in in the region but yes it's still minimum yeah the number is relatively smaller but uh, uh the number of advocacy program uh, project is really smaller but very effective yeah that's 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 what i found so far the strategy and this is very uh, uh very interesting uh civil society in is in east asia, east asia first uh they make friends on the inside it means uh they really uh, uh what's it try to build personal relations uh with whoever in the in the uh in the uh, uh whoever is the policy maker yeah make friends on the inside uh, build network strong network with the inside and then uh they tend to do uh to go through education both to edu uh, educate the grassroots and the uh, and the elites, and I, I didn't say that uh, civil society and Southeast Asia doesn't uh, do uh, did not do this, but yes, uh, this is one of the key strategies, and they, they want to make sure that uh, whatever they do work locally and work for business. I think uh, uh, these things uh, um, make it work for business in order to get like financial uh, support. Um, is I can say that it's not really in the like a main strategy of uh, civil society in Southeast Asia, and the most important, uh, most most interesting thing for me is that civil so society in East Asia try to engage the heart through art. It's very interesting because we 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 don't have we don't have this kind of this kind of uh, approach in 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 Southeast Asia. We don't really use uh we don't really use art. We don't really uh say that we are we we we, we want to engage the heart uh so far what we well, what i find in southeast asia that we, uh, with uh, our engagement both with the government and with with the grassroots is we we tend to use more 
uh, on like rationality what is good what is bad uh, what is better uh, approach what is good situations it's not really uh, 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 using the heart yeah so with this rather different uh, uh, characters is really is cooperation really possible uh, yes it is possible of course it's possible with uh, 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 the, the character is slightly different but uh, I can I can sense that uh, civil society in both regions really works towards similar goal yeah and uh, the, the different strengths the different strategies works really well complement each other uh, we can learn from uh, uh, its other weakness and its other strengths and so it can be really good uh, what's say a cooperation but uh, uh, what I want to really suggest is that uh, when we talk about, uh, I mean, um, probably this afternoon or tomorrow, or tomorrow we talk about strategy. It is very, it is very, very imp important to uh, take time to really discuss working mechanism, um, working mechanism for cooperation and coordination. One of my research show that uh, uh, if we don't really uh, talk about mechanism of uh, mechanism of cooperation and coordination at the very beginning. Uh, what we discuss today or, uh, in, in our meeting will just be a discussion because there will be like uh, so many uh, pro uh, uh, probably problem uh, uh, what say occur uh, in the future. It is also important to uh, really put a strategy on how to get along well with national and regional institution because uh, at the end they are the policymaker uh, and at the end we need their support. Uh, 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 to whatever uh, uh, our idea is, and also learning from the experience of uh, uh, so far, it's also uh, important to really think about how to get support from international organizations. Yeah, uh, from international organization, uh, we, we, we not only get like for example funding, uh, but also we can get uh, we can learn more about the norms on, on, on norms on human rights, norm on um, um, migration. We, are, we can also learn about what Professor Piper said earlier about a better governance, better migration governance. What what does it mean and how how to make it fit into our uh, our region? So yes, it's it's very important to to also get support from international organization. Yeah, so there's, there's uh, three points of my suggestion on what we can discuss uh, this afternoon and, and tomorrow. And with that, I end my presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Iberilis. It was really, really great to, great to hear the, your analysis between um, Southeast Asian experiences and your, your observation on East Asian uh, context as well. Um, thank you so much. Let's um, hear from Daniel and then uh, so we can have a discussions on what we actually going to do um, together. Thank you, thank you, Mariko, and uh, I thank you so much for uh, the prominent uh, speaker, any uh, prominent activist, of course, prominent academics as Professor Nicola and Dr. Iris, who already shared with us. Uh, I couldn't more agree than what everything you have uh, presented, basically. So uh, I thought that it used to listen this. A long time ago, maybe three years ago, when we start to uh, initiate this uh, uh, cooperation and initiative, then I will not, you know, dropping and also fall in in the in, in, in some like, silly silly uh, mistake. But let me also share a bit uh, to you. Also, I'd like to extend, uh, uh, you know, deepest condolence for Agile from from Malaysia, from Tanaganita. We are, you know, really uh, really sorry, uh, and also uh, please accept our deepest condolence uh, to our friend and sister yeah. so i'd like to share my 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 presentation uh, by uh, uh, you know can you see my screen or not yet wait a minute wait a minute this one maybe so in the last 3 years basically uh, my organization Human Rights Working Group together with our uh, network and partner organization with the support of the Sasakawi Post Foundation, we try to uh, think, we try to also discuss uh, on how are we going to really uh, set up a, a, a bridge, uh, you know, of, of, of communication, of discussion, of, of a space where 
uh, at least uh, civil society actor, both region can can learn each other, can share each other, especially on the issues of uh, uh, migrant worker and, and, and their family, and on how are we going to really support uh, the, the, the protection of, of for, for their rights. So uh, as already mentioned and introduced by Mariko, so it's our WG uh, start working in the uh, migrant worker issues back to uh, around uh, a decade ago, especially when uh, we set up a coalition, we call it ARAC, ARAC meaning advocacy for the ratification of the convention, or ARAC, it's like uh, Indonesian sake, you know, Indonesian soju, you know, it's like very much Indonesian, you know, like a, a typically uh, like to make some abbreviation that makes people are really, you know, uh, trigger to, to, to follow. And then of course, in ASEAN process, it's RWG also actively engaging with the, with the, with the, with the regionalism process, advocacy on the national ASEAN community. And we did a study uh, dedicated for the recommendation of ASEAN framework on migrant labor, because in ASEAN we have a, a trilateral, a, a tripartite plus meeting, you know, we call ASEAN forum on migrant labor. And then we know all together that uh, uh, lately that uh, ASEAN come up with the ASEAN consensus back 2017. And we observe uh, during our uh, advocacy on the ASEAN consensus, uh, migrant worker community and civil society are, are left behind. We are not really invited. We are not really asked to be there. Only among government, they work among of them talk about the, the, the issue of migrant worker. So what uh, Professor Nicola already mentioned about any stand in the UN level, uh, nothing about us without us is really uh, uh, neglected by the ASEAN process. So that's why it's RWG is proactively activate and active in, in, in the regionalism process through come up you know, uh, with some, some study. First of all, we'd like to you know, uh, uh, share with you our study uh, back to 2018. At the moment, we, we want to have a baseline study about the situation that we use the, 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 the lens of uh, ASEAN consensus so what's really happening when the, the ASEAN consensus used as our uh, perspective to really look at uh, the situation of migrant worker in ASEAN. And right after that, we also engage in some policy dialogue in eight of 10 ASEAN member states in how are we going to be you know, uh, included and invited, especially on the implementation of the uh, ASEAN consensus because on the planning, on the drafting, we are left behind but uh, we do proactively when the implementation, at least we are on, uh, on the same, uh, uh, you know, uh, on the same page. So uh, here I'm sure we have, uh, you know, I have some friend uh, together with us that, you know, maybe a year or two years back, uh, we, we work together on these issues. And of course, in the uh, ASEAN government, the migrant issue is really look at, uh, especially from, from the perspective of ascending country or origin countries such as Indonesia, uh, more and more, and they are look at in the economic benefit remittance. So we come up with the study on stay behind children because we want to also have another discussion on social cost of migration. So uh, last year we 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 come uh, we, we 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 launched this this study in Indonesia, uh, Philippines, and, and 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 Myanmar. So this is exactly the remittances. Of course, the Philippines is the you know, the first, and then followed by the the, the Vietnam. And then and, and some other for Indonesia and, and so on and so forth. So still, I agree with with, with Professor uh, Pepper uh, saying that the the migrants government is more uh, focused rather than uh, labor governance itself. So so of course this is our concern. Where in the issues of economic, they are seen as a, a source of cheap labor, and then a lot of uh, security measures imposed to to their you know uh, to, to their existence in, in in especially in in host countries. So this is the trend between East and Southeast Asia. Any already explained about it, and then this number is also increasing. So while lacking platform of cooperation, communication among actors, so we thought that it is important to uh, set up or proactively come up with the uh, initiative. So this is the trend. Of course, the interdependency on migrant labor. Uh, the new trends is about. Uh, aging population and then economic women economic participation, of course, the economic growth and, and development. As well as we, we see, we observe now that a lot of issues of forced migration because of conflict or national disaster, 
you know we we see you know together what's happening in in, in Myanmar today it's, it's really really you know uh, heartbreaking and of course it is also one of the cause of of migration before in in, in Rakhine state also uh, push and also pull back to, to to Myanmar especially what's happened in Malaysia uh, recent days uh, back and then of course uh, the trend is uh, migrant worker are and then categorized and grant uh, their visa their existence through 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 the national policies and and and, and laws so mainly uh, done under the bilateral cooperation and uh, within uh, uh, develop bilateral cooperation and talk we are never been included so uh, migrant worker community civil society never been in, included in the in, in the discussion so the issue of course under representation on on such such uh, such, such talk both in bilaterally or or or, or, or uh, multilaterally so under representation on the socio politic security measure source of cheap labor on the economic and in the socio cultural uh, uh, issues they are treated as others you know and migrant community always and left behind in the you know like a, a development of the the, the the policy so it started 3 years back uh, 2018 and the photo in your screen is our uh, uh, first exercise in bangkok 2019 uh, to really uh, uh, discuss about the possibility of cooperation uh, trying to uh, look at some issues of uh, uh, as a, a communalities and also we followed with the uh, research of pre-departure process of Indonesian migrant worker uh, to Japan and also we develop, we call it BBC, the better engagement between East and Southeast Asia and during the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, some of them who attended in Bangkok, we invite again to be our, uh, uh, we come up with joint research that uh, uh, recently we, we launched the, the book Repression and Resilient. From this exercise, we come up with proposed guideline to protect migrant worker rights during the public health crisis. It is basically a lesson learned from, from the joint research. Uh, and then uh, it, it, it basically comprises of three things, a general principle and then some rights, a very specific right that affected by the uh, COVID pandemic. And, and lastly thing about the role of uh, uh, CSO and international cross-regional organization. In the general principle, we really, uh, you know, um, uh, ask the state to really recognize the specific and structural vulnerability that happened to migrant workers, especially during the public health crisis. We also, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, ask the state to really acknowledge the, the resilience by the community that need to be uh, supported uh, through some policy and measure, not really using the, the nationality the immigration status as the as a as the criteria to provide uh, health uh, uh, support and, and services and so on and so forth so non discriminatory treatment equality is, is is has to be there and there are some rights that really really suffer uh, during during the pandemic so where are we heading as a region so uh, of course you know it is just uh, uh, to, to 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 help us to 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 simplify the 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 the, the problem I set at least two, two variable, you know, going to up uh, more uh, cooperation to the regional and international and goes to the right empowering from uh, from the, you know, not really empowering, going to the empowerment of, for, 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 for the society. So uh, if we go to the, uh, uh, you know, uh, bottom left, there is like a approach, nationalist isolation and also empowering uh, authority. Maybe this, this quadrant represent what's happening in, in North Korea, maybe. There is almost isolationist uh, 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 cooperation, but there is almost no empowering then. Of, of course, maybe it is effective some way. There is zero, zero, zero uh, case of, of COVID, maybe, you know. But going to the up, maybe there is, there is a kind of, you know, uh, international cooperation, but only empowering the authority. It, it represents maybe the cooperation in Southeast Asia, while the cooperation is really heavy in, 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 in the elite level, in the governmental level, but the society is, uh, is, 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 is lack, lack behind, is far away. So I think uh, whether our, our society will go, to, uh, our, our cooperation go to that way, strengthening the elite or, 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 or vice versa. And then go to the right, uh, this, uh, uh, most of uh, our, our, our country, uh, do it that more okay we, we deal empowering society but really under 
the, 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 the national circumstances. So we don't really look at what's happening in our neighboring. So I think it is, it is of, of course, uh, better because there is uh, empowerment in the, in the society, but there are some, some lacking point if you are only see this thing, because maybe we are thinking that our national is more important than, than, than foreigner, something like that. But our study suggests that we uh, have to come up, even maybe it is more a complicated one, international cooperation by empowering society. Basically, this is the, 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 the proposal uh, to talk about. And, uh, you know, uh, bringing uh, or, or, or bringing our proposal to the practice, we at least have at least three challenges, whether uh, it is will be successful or not. It really depend whether uh, the national interest is really influencing and embodied in the, their migration policy. So, so bringing the right base and democratic uh, uh, upholding uh, democratic principle is really, uh, you know, we will we will face how their national interest set to uh, migrant uh, cooperation with other country. Of course, uh, we will see uh, the the different of historical and political uh, context uh, that you know somehow. Uh, uh, dynamic within the country, the change leadership, different see on, on how they, 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 they see uh, the issue of migrant worker. And lastly thing, it's depend on the level of democracy and capacity of enabling civil society to advocate the migrant worker issues and also how to, uh, to get impact in the decision making process. So our study also uh, suggests that we not just only addressing the issue of migrant worker itself, but also work on the issue of uh, democratization. So uh, this is my last slide. So as a wise forward, so I totally agree with the suggestion uh, from uh, Professor Nicola. We need to really uh, sit together to identifying the issues and area commonly shared by our network, the gap that we need to fill, especially during the current situation. And then we try to explore some possible way to really amplify it. The, the existing, the established initiative, both locally, regionally, and internationally. So we don't really, you know, need to re, uh, duplicate, replicate. We need to have like a labor division among us, you know. Uh, so then it's like more solidarity and, and supporting each other. Uh, like what already uh, mentioned by Buriris that, you know, there is, of course, yes, possible, but there are some uh, consideration that need to be considered. So of course, learning each other is very important from the experience, uh, using uh, now, I think, new media, we have to really come up with the new approaches, especially to target a wider audience. So start from from, from last year, we, we try to come up with some ideas uh, to set up uh, basically an online platform. We used like a podcast to really voicing out the concern, uh, voicing, uh, uh, you know, a problem faced by the migrant worker themselves in, in particular country. You know, in order we can, you know, uh, uh, learn each other and of course, in some other uh, extinct social media. So uh, we, we, we call ourselves BBC. Uh, our tag is share and then connect and later on we can collaborate. I, I thank you so much. Hopefully uh, it is, uh, you know, uh, really uh, also uh, contribute to the discussion because this is uh, our effort that of course uh, we need. Uh, I encourage really you to, to, to join with our, our movement because it's like movement building. So 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 looking forward to, get, to, to have any any thought and suggestion and, and further uh, 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 critic. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, thank you for all our excellent speakers, um, the panel. Just a very, my very brief comment at the end, as an East Asian person in, in here, I really so much to learn from the experiences of uh, Southeast Asian civil society as well. And as outlined by Buddhists, uh, maybe it is a lot of challenges for us to kind of engage with um, the regional uh, civil society advocacy work. But together, I think, you know, as now we see in a lot of uh, people, especially on the migration issues, a lot of uh, cross-cutting issues that uh, they cross regionally. And I think, yeah, I will, after this, uh, we will pass on to Parafendi who will facilitate. Sorry, I left a very limited time because it was a lot to take on from the discussion, uh, from the panelists, but I hope we can continue with the discussions. As for our ways forward to ampli amplify our, our, you know, which one of us are doing. So thank you. I'll pass over to you, um, Parafendi, for the next um, discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mariko. We are quite uh, early in our time. And I understand, is my voice clear enough? Okay. 
Yeah. Uh, now we have uh, we have quite a plenty of time now for the discussion. According to the plan, we are supposed to have uh, our schedule is actually at three o'clock uh, for Q and A and discussion. But now um, we we have finished uh, even maybe about thirty. We have thirty minutes more uh, for discussion. Uh, I would like actually to invite uh, all participants. We have participants, attendees here, both in uh, via Zoom as well as some numbers via YouTube, yeah? Uh, so I heard there is a suggestion just to uh, upgrade all attendees into the panelists. Would that be possible? I look at the committee. Uh, each time while waiting, so each of the attendees will be transformed into a panelist. So while waiting for that process, uh, there is a request now to have first a photo session. So I would like to invite uh, everybody to show your face. And but if you wish, if you don't like to, your face to be shown, that's your, <laughs> that's your, uh, your prerogative rights, of course. But we would like to have this event to be, uh, to be documentized and documented very well. So I look at who is going to take the pictures. Daniel, is it Icha or Icha? Icha. Okay, Icha, can you lead? Uh, the... Usually, Ibu Yuyun, usually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. We I have to recognize Ibu Yuyun, well, you know, our excellencies in the eye chair. Usually, is is taking... so my responsibility is to take picture. <laughs> 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 okay. Right. Um, one, two, three. Smile. Next page. All right. Uh, one, two, three. Once more. One, two, three. Once more. Uh, the other page. All right. This one. One, two, three. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Excellency Yu Yun. <laughs> so we have an Excellency who becoming a picture taking. <laughs> person. <laughs> That's very nice. <laughs> All right. Now we are getting serious. Uh, we have heard the four speakers as well as the opening speech from uh, Mr. Adeshi about uh, the, there is a more awareness uh, from the East Asian uh, society as well as uh, uh, indication uh, stated by, by Daniel in his presentation, the, the need, uh, the growing, the growing uh, aging process, populations in the aging, and the growing needs for uh, East Asia for, to have uh, migrant workers. And, uh, but uh, Sadechi also even saying that it's a kind of uh, new destination countries. Well, that's, and I look at the numbers, it is true. It's one of the biggest among the East Asian countries. It reads a number of more than 1 million migrant workers, at least the one who is already documented, uh, but later can become undocumented, of course. But then according to the record, yes, Japan is apparently taking a lead in the process of a uh, becoming a destination countries. So there is a lot thing has been done as well inside uh, uh, the Japanese as uh, both government and civil society to really prepare the whole society, the whole nation to live by, side by side with the migrant workers uh, in their daily life. I think that is also the case in Taiwan in, uh, in South Korea, 
And we have all participants here from the, those regions as well, even in mainland China. Although in mainland China, we have a kind of a mixed phenomenon because there are also people from mainland China who are migrating outside. Uh, we have heard the presentation from, from first the pictures from uh, any, a very good pictures, uh, especially addressing about the, the worsening situation during the pandemic, and as, as well as the challenge, uh, uh, what is need to be done as a priority issues, the key challenges, and uh, what, what are the most important thing in the context of the post-pandemic, uh, the post-pandemic area. And uh, I like to also highlight one key point from Nicole, which was mentioned by Daniel as well, that uh, in terms of global policy, as well as national or regional policy, apparently, according to you, you argue that uh, there is more attention given, particularly in terms of government resources on the border control, on the governance of the migration instead of the governance in the labor itself. That means the working condition, yeah, living and working condition. That's, that becoming, that's quite striking uh, information, you know, after all we heard about the global compact on migration, we have the convention who is trying hard to, to do, uh, to have a compliance with the member state, you know, to be recognized. Yeah? And apparently the language also becoming more managing migrants, yeah? instead of make, managing the labor condition of the migrants. That's very interesting. That's a very good points that can be taken up in our discussion uh, now and tomorrow. And uh, another point from Nicole, I think is important to underline is the synergy among different network. Yeah, even in our, in our forum now, uh, that's why I've been, before the preparation, I'm trying to also engage those people who are engaging in the global compact migration because there is an Asia Pacific process going on. Civil society is trying to organize themselves, facilitated by the UN and by member state as well. Even in Indonesia, government in Indonesia is the one who is also uh, trying to take lead uh, on the issue of global compact involving civil society. You know? So synergy among different network is still a very serious challenge, even in the context of uh, cooperation in the two sub region. So now I'd like to invite anybody who would like to raise your hands, feel free. If you don't raise your hand, I keep on asking and asking from the presentation, no? <laughs> Please, anybody would like to raise your hands, feel free. Fajal, I think. Yes. Fajal, somebody. Yeah, good. You can raise your hands visually yeah. as well. <laughs> good afternoon, Pa Ravendi and others. Yes. Yeah. I, I wrote a little bit in, in the chat box, but I probably I just verbally share one, some questions that I have. I mean, uh, first of all, thank you to Nicola that uh, tribute to Angels. Uh, yeah, we, we, we are still in the grieving process and then tomorrow will be the funeral. <clears throat> and, uh, one point that I would like to ask, probably if Nicola or others can respond. The, on the issue of uh, universal social protections, uh, that in, in Malaysian context, uh, the only voice that talking about it is uh, Socialist Party of Malaysia. And uh, I believe in in most country in the region that use the liberal economics approach, and I I kind of, of having having a questions that 
or doubt rather that the those country that uh, operates in the liberal economics will even consider this uh, what you call it the universal uh, universal social protection including universal basic income uh, yeah so do you think or is there any kind of approach that have been thought about to to get people to get government consider this uh, universal uh, social protections to be even talk about i mean so, i mean probably we, if if because i, I believe this this is uh, from the socialist perspective it's very very socialist perspective whereas we know this most of these governments are they are liberal economics so yeah that's my question thank you okay thank you pafazar you have uh, a bit ideological qu questions <laughs> in the context of origin in both area but i think we should not forget as well in southeast asia is uh, there are there are socialist countries, you know? yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, communist countries as well. And uh, but uh, you're right. Probably in practice, you know, even China is practicing uh, liberal economy in their in their in the way they operate in other countries. Uh, I I would like to also yeah. to recall, yeah, I would like to underline one input from Riris. Riris, uh, yes, just explain to us the potential of collaboration. Yes, collaboration is needed. Collaboration is possible. And how are you going to fill up that collaboration? Yeah, uh, each of the civil society in East Asia and in uh, Southeast Asia has its own characteristic that is highlighted. And but this different strategy and characteristic should be actually becoming complementing each other. So that's the proposal. So I like to hear responses as well from uh, members of this uh, forum, both from Southeast Asia as well as from the East Asia. You know, or whether you agree or not with this, if you agree, then maybe you can also add some meat on that agreement. Why do you think you agree? So that would be very good for our discussion. Okay, may I now invite Nico to answer Fajar question, please. Yes. Fajal, thank you so much for a super important question, uh, which is really not easy to answer. Um, this, the, this concept or principle of universal social protection is obviously something the International Labour Organization has pushed for you know, decades and decades, and there is an actual fact in the ILO convention. Now, the challenge here is, one thing is to think about universal social protection from within a national frame of uh, reference, right? So to cover everyone within a, a certain territory, right? Including, for example, migrants. But what migration has, has demonstrated, and now also the COVID pandemic is, we need to think about universal social protection really truly universally in terms of, you know, a solidarity also among between countries, so not only within countries, right? And I guess here, um, the, the regional entities like uh, EU, ASEAN, Mercosur and so forth do have a role, but I understand as far as ASEAN is concerned, there is, very little concrete discussion on how to do a redistribution of wealth and how to really think about, um, you know, implementing universal social protection. And of course, as you also said, there are massive ideological um, um, divides here in terms of either political parties, how they approach it. The one interesting thing here though is, um, and this is again what, what COVID has demonstrated here, I'm currently based in the UK, I'm not British, but I'm currently based in the UK. And the conservative government in place right now is in actual fact uh, during this COVID pandemic has implemented policies that have traditionally been a Labour Party policy yeah, in terms of dishing out furlough schemes, you know, um, and, and, and beefing up uh, public spending, uh, where the Labour Party basically has nothing to criticize because they are always going, this is actually our, this is, these are our principles, right? So this crisis has in actual fact forced conservatives to, to do something, but this is only an example from here. Now, in terms of um, basic income, um, uh, you asked, do we have any examples? Now, actually have very little concrete examples. I understand in uh, Germany, there is a 
pilot scheme currently of trying out basic income, yeah, giving um, uh, several thousand people are part of this pilot and, and, and giving them a thousand euro a month and see what happens. And the outcome has actually been extremely positive, but this is only a pilot scheme. Now, there, uh, a few years ago, there, there was a referendum in Switzerland. Unfortunately, the Swiss uh, voted against the idea of a basic income. Um, I believe somewhere in Scandinavia it's being tried. But again, this is it's, it's very controversial. And unfortunately, um, on, on a more global scale, we have not really been able to push this enough. But there, it is a debate. And I have the sense uh, this debate is being revived at the moment. But this is really something where I guess we also need to do more research. We need to do, yeah, we need to really figure out um, how this could so unfortunately, I have a revolutionary answer here that can give you um, it's more of a theory than a practice, unfortunately, in particular beyond borders, you know, uh, when, if you think just be beyond just a national frame of reference, you know, and this is really what we have to do. We have to think beyond borders. And I guess one of the crucial things also obviously always is funding. Now, how is this being funded? And I guess one parallel one could draw um, and think about, and again, I know very little about this, is, is the global movement um, uh, for some, some tax. I can't remember if it's the Tobin tax or there's been a global movement trying to argue we need a global institution, um, you know, for some sort of global um, um, taxation and then also to, uh, handing out uh, funding. Um, globally in a, some sort of redistributive system. But again, this is something we need to research and we need to look into to kind of see if there is an example out there we can draw from. Okay, thank you, Nicola. Do you, uh, be, may I remind uh, all of attendees before you ask question to introduce yourself? Bafajar forgot uh, to introduce yourself. Of course, I know Bafajar. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I'm. I'm Fajar, I'm Indonesian. I'm living in Malaysia, working with Tanaganita. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, now we heard the answer from Nicole already. Uh, anybody would like to follow up the question or the answer, or you have another question? Uh, I see Lennon, are you raising hands? Lennon? All right, I'll give Lennon first and then you, Yun. All right. Lennon, you have the floor. Okay, yeah, thanks, uh, Fendi. Uh, so yeah, I'm Lennon Wang uh, from uh, Serve the People Association and a labor NGO in Taiwan. Um, I have uh, two remarks. One is a feedback on the uh, global, uh, sorry, you missed that. Um, in the, uh, the universal social protection or the, or the universal social security, I think this is super important. I have these kind of thoughts. Um, and even years ago, but I, totally immature. Um, I always feel this: there is a very lack of justice for migrant workers who have to cross the border to work. They have many of them. They they spend different years in each different countries. So after all, maybe they have spent ten or even twenty or thirty years. That's the best part of their lives abroad. When they go home, they are older, and and, and but because they are always transferring, so they cannot, many of the time, or most of the times, they cannot fit, fit in any of the basic uh, year of service of, uh, to, to acquire the social protection, so, uh, 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 precisely the pension in any country, both the, the host country and also their own country. In some countries like the Philippines, they have a, they have a kind of a, a, lot, a pension but we know it's very small. Uh, people cannot really rely on that. And in some countries, like in, like in Taiwan, the government systematically and intentionally plan the system to exclude the migrants totally. So, so like, like, for example, now the, uh, most of the migrant workers in Taiwan, they, they can work for 12 years only. For caretakers at home, they can work for, 12, for 14 years. But the, but the house workers, they are excluded from labor laws and labor, uh, uh, labor insurance. For those who are under the labor insurance, they cannot fit the, ma the minimum year of service of 15 years to have pension. So they cannot have pension. Well, but even they can have, they 
they still can have a lump sum money, so-called retirement fee, even they don't have the, uh, so much years, so many years. But the problem is they have to reach the, the age of 65. And it's impossible for any migrant worker to still work in, in Taiwan when they are, they are 65. So they will be at home maybe in the Philippines, in Vietnam, in Indonesia, in Thailand, there is no system at all to assist them to claim the money abroad. So what they can do, no one ever have came to Taiwan to apply for this. So this is totally crazy. It's a, it's a, it's a system of in, injustice. We steal their money. We steal their contribution monthly from their own payment in the labor insurance, but they cannot get any single dollar from that. That's really totally crazy. So that's the first. We, I, I know in some countries there are the other dialogues and there are even systems to amend these problems. I know in EU, they have some kind of system to amend this because the people, they cross border of all EU region. And I know even between Taiwan and mainland China, even this, they ha, they, they, they ha, there are some uh, dialogues to discuss. But usually the most, the easiest way is to buy, buy, buy the year of service. For example, someone from Taiwan is, will be assigned to, to China. So they will change the employer, change the legal employer, even they're under the same company. So the company may might, uh, buy their year of service. So they will continue the year there. Well, it's not so good, but at least there's a, there is a kind of arrangement to, sub, to compensate in some way, but for the migrants, because they are blue collar, they are they are low in class and they are ignored by the government, by the politicians, they don't have power, they are totally ignored. That's the first thing. And the sec second thing I want to I want to be very quick. I think the NGOs in all the Sandy and, and the receiving countries or CSO, we we should have common or at least similar demands to push our individual governments to have more protection on the migrant workers. Let's take one thing, for example, the placement fee. That's one of, one of the most fundamental rule, uh, uh, rule cause for exploitation on all the migrant workers. We know how terrible it is, how much money they have to pay to go abroad to work. If the Indonesian government last year, they announced a very remarkable, very brave announcement. They announced they, 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 they want to have a zero, placement fee policy, they listed uh, 10 job categories, including the domestic workers, the seamen, but they didn't in include the factory workers yet. But sadly, they postponed the enforcement of the uh, policy to July. So um, I think the sending countries, the government of the sending country, they should have the same demand and they, they should expand the zero placement fee to all to all workers, to all categories, not only the seamen and, and, and the factory and the, and the domestic workers, but also factory workers. It should be the employers to pay the placement fee because they are, it's them who benefit from the labor of the workers. But it, it's not, it's very far from that. So just like what Annie mentioned earlier, very correctly, that the migrants of different nationality, they compete to each other by lower, lowering down their price. So when the, the, after the announcement of Indonesian government, very ridiculously and shamefully, shamefully, the response from the Taiwan government was, they don't buy it. They didn't ex accept it. And they even said, we will try to uh, find other source country to, to find my, more migrant workers. And we knew that their, they are, they, what, they, what they were thinking was Myanmar. So that's the country who is, which is under the military coup now. So it's really, and, and, and so what I want to say is we really have to push the government and, and to, to have a common stand. We, we cannot let them to, to use this strategy to uh, diversify the, the collective power of the workers. Thanks. Thanks, Lennon, for your inputs. So you underline the importance of one uh, thematic issues that can be part of the collaboration is on the social security, universal social security, particularly with regard to the uh, pension funds. We heard, as we all know, in the ASEAN context on the implementation of ASEAN consensus 
on the protection of migrant workers. That's also one of the topic that we said that has been discussed. The so-called portable portable social security protection. Uh, I like now to invite Yu Yun. You raise your hands a while ago. Uh, over to you, Yu Yun. Uh, thank you, Pak Rafendi. Yes, I just uh, just uh, a point for information. Uh, since Fajar asked about the uh, universal social security, at least in the context of ASEAN, uh, ACMW uh, had discussed about uh, um, portable social security. Uh, I think the name has been uh, framed as such as, as at the moment. Um, I attended the sharing of the um, uh, the study in relation to the ASEAN portable social security for migrant workers. There was there, there has been a lot of questions, problems. Who will pay for the social security and so on and so on. So, uh, if the question is whether or not ASEAN member state discuss about it, yes. Uh, whether or not they have been able to solve the problems, no. It is ongoing. Uh, now that uh, discussion had been included into the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework, I think COVID-19 uh, opened up the possibilities of discuss this further because some countries experience how uh, how group uh, how the public health really uh, should include uh, migrant workers. So you are not safe until everyone is safe. So that's that. I think the 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 expression that uh, cover, uh, that has been very uh, uh, prominent in do, during COVID-19. Uh, in ITER, uh, um, we also will be, we, we will be discussing about the uh, uh, universal health coverage for migrant workers, uh, bringing the idea of portable uh, migrant workers, uh, portable social security for migrant workers. Uh, so I think the appetite to discuss about about this part particular issue is quite good and gain momentum during COVID-19, uh, but we still do not know how it moves forward. Uh, with the current situation in Myanmar, I think we, we cannot avoid that our agenda this year will a little bit change, uh, looking at the how the situation goes uh, in Myanmar. Uh, but in terms of basic incomes, uh, I haven't heard anything that ASEAN talk about best, uh, universal basic income for migrant workers. Perhaps this is something that uh, civil society want to uh, table during the uh, ASEAN uh, AFML uh, as one of the idea to, to discuss. Uh, for the, uh, the other thing that I would like to uh, respond is the uh, the cooperation between East Asia and Southeast Asia. Uh, we had actually uh, some experiences uh, with SAPA, uh, so, uh, Asia, what is SAPA? Um, Solidarity Advocacy People in Asia, I think. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, this this kind of network has uh, a lot of people from, from Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and East Asia, uh, but we found uh, difficult to uh, to really come together because we have very detailed and specific issues, and almost impossible to talk about the issue in one panel in one in one room, uh, because every time we talk about one one issue, uh, there is something that. Uh, uh, that there are many dimension of Southeast Asia or East Asia or South Asia were not necessarily be able to express. Uh, so that is why SAPA was divided into Southeast Asia, South Asia and East Asia. So every time we, we, we will have a meeting, these three groups will, will meet and then there will be a panel in which we can share. This is what we have discussed uh, in, our, in our group in Southeast Asia, in East Asia and South Asia and, and um, South Asia. One thing that made them together was actually the issue of peace and security, the issue of peace, conflict. That's something that bring them together. And areas in which they, uh, uh, of course, uh, with, the, with the current situation, uh, maybe uh, selection of issues becoming wider. For instance, migrant workers, I think, uh, more and more, we find we found a number of similarities uh, uh, among uh, 
different uh, Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, East Asia, and uh, 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 South Asia. And the other areas uh, is to frame the platform into uh, sharing of information, sharing of experience. So usually this kind of approach will work. And for networking and solidarity, whenever one country or one region has problem, we, we can always uh, rely on our our networks in South Asia and Southeast Asia to amplify the voices. So that's also something that can be used. And the other one is referral system. So uh, for instance, uh, there has been a number of uh, advantages. Uh, we, we, we face a lot of problems of not uh, one organization in Jakarta uh, face a lot of problem in relation to Indonesian labors uh, that uh, let off by the Korean uh, companies in Indonesia because they just left without paying uh, the, the, the salary of the Indonesian uh, workers. So through our network, through our uh, tracing, we managed to uh, find the uh, the person. We managed to table. Well, they managed to table uh, the case in uh, on the attention of the National Human Rights Commission in Korea. So, uh, so this kind of referral system, fam in terms of family tracing, in in terms of finding uh, the um, uh, uh, relevant person on on the issue has been very, very useful using this kind of uh, network. Um, yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Yuyun, for sharing the experience on the collaboration of Asia, White Asia, through the SAPA network. And now it's only, I think it left now with ASEAN only, eh? without the South, without the East Asia. Of course, we have to, recognize as well, there are cross-regional organizations like Migrant Forum Asia, we have invited, but I think nobody now come from Migrant Forum Asia. Uh, and then APWLD, we have here, I think, participant from APWLD is a cross-regional, cross even Asia Pacific, you know, is wider. Uh, but of course, uh, the APWD is issues is woman law and development and migrant workers rights is one of the issue uh, so, but that's that's the network uh, available that makes um, that makes collaborations will be much easier from east and southeast asia i guess that's that's the context i like now to invite the next on the on the list of my uh, intervention here anderson Fila. yeah over to you. Can you, you mention uh, your name and where you're from? Thank you, uh, Sir Rafendi. I'm Anderson Villa. You may call me Andy from Mindanao State University, General Santo City. Uh, I'm very glad to be invited by Sir Daniel uh, to be here. I, uh, we met, I guess, uh, uh, was it last year? Uh, we, uh, we met or 2019 with Yuyun and uh, Mariko is here and also invited my friend here, uh, Miss Inurisa Ilento from the Mindanao Migrant Center. And uh, actually I raised my hand because I just wanna say um, hello to, aside from my points, hello to uh, Professor Nicola Piper. Uh, I, 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 I really am a, a fan of your work. I've been uh, citing your work uh, for my dissertation while uh, doing my research in Japan. And uh, you, you mentioned very striking points there. Uh, I guess it, I, I've been looking at that in, in, in your research on the, the need to strengthen uh, NGOs, uh, network uh, to address the concern of the migrants and uh, it's uh, it's been mentioned already by uh, you Yun, no? that hopefully we could engage more with the ASEAN no? aside from working with receiving countries like Japan, Malaysia and Singapore in East and Southeast Asia uh, this is where this is what we call a backlog no in terms of uh, needing to engage with the ASEAN because the, the case is always that, for instance, if we raise the concern, not just migrant issues, but also human rights issues, 
the the members of the ASEAN would just say, no, let, that's a, a very domestic concern. We will not intervene. We respect, <laughs> uh, which is also happening here in the Philippines. Uh, sorry to say, and uh, they would uh, just you know uh, shape off any comments because they respect the domestic concern. But uh, uh, I guess the NGOs, the civil society organizations, need to do more. Uh, Right now, this is uh, one of the best initiatives that HRWG is doing together with Sasakawa, that we engage more organizations. Like in, in, in our case, uh, there are NGOs that address uh, migrants' concern. And for instance, here in Mindanao, we have uh, our Mindanao Migrant Center. So there is a need to also involve, not just for instance in the Philippines, not just Manila Base, or capital-based organizations, so also in other regions, to you know, to somehow uh, include our voices in the periphery as well. And uh, as you mentioned a while ago, governments uh, are becoming ever more powerful, you know, regulating and controlling. But perhaps if the national government can't work for, for it, we can also engage with local governments or provincial governments like. In Japan, this is a thing, like city governments address the concern. Uh, Suda and uh, PAC, uh, the study of uh, the, the scholars from Japan would mention local citizenship. And uh, also here in, in Mindanao, in, in Davao particularly, we have NGOs that work closely with local governments. So these are, these are ways, I guess, but uh, to, you know, to, to address short-term concern, but uh, there should be like a structural region-wide level, uh, you know, coordination with all of this NGO. And I'm very glad that uh, Daniel uh, invited me uh, with, the, with HRWG uh, to somehow, you know, include the organizations outside of Manila to bring them. In, uh, in fact, we'll be having a forum uh, weeks from now on uh, together with Ateneo Migration Center, which is a an, an, the uh, university in Davao and the Mindanao Migrant Center. So these are, I guess, ways and means, but we have to multiply this, uh, you know, to reach to the ASEAN level. So I'm sorry if I'm talking too much, uh, but I am very glad to meet you, uh, Professor Piper here. Uh, I've been citing your work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy Villa. No, you're not taking too long. I think your input is very useful. Uh, even uh, collaboration, when we talk about East Asia and Southeast Asia, even within, within a country, there is some, there is some uh, somehow there is also a gap between uh, uh, civil society working in the capitals as well, civil society working on the ground. So you, you, you're correctly right when we are engaging East Asia as well uh, at the region wide, you need to also be careful, not be careful, bear in mind to include, you know, uh, NGO activists at the local level, because they might have more uh, good collaboration at the local government rather than at the capital, right? And they are the people who are actually dealing with daily uh, short term, you call it short term concerns. So thank you for that. That's to, I think a good input in terms of our our discussion uh, uh, this afternoon or tomorrow. May I invite now? Uh, yeah, I was chatting with uh, Riska, and Riska I know her not only because she's Indonesian, but uh, she's also in the Asia Pacific Women and Law and Development. I just mentioned her organization. So I would like to invite Riska to share on two points, on the experience of EWLD on collaboration of the both uh, East Asia as well as uh, Southeast Asia. And the second probably on the issue, what do you think will be the, 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 the uh, common, common uh, advocacy issues that you have been waging? And we, we discuss here in our, already some common issue, for example, like pre-departures issue, uh, children's left behind issues, and recruitment and place for me issue, right? 
as well as the universal social security issues. So these are the issues that we have already kind of listed in our discussion. Uh, Riska, over to you. Thank you, Pae. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Riska. Uh, just as uh, Pae mentioned uh, before that, I'm from EPWLD, now based in uh, Chiang Mai. Uh, so if I'm allowed to uh, introduce a little bit uh, more about the EPWLD, so we are uh, the leading network of um, feminist organizations and individual activists uh, in the Asia Pacific region, and uh, our member now it's uh, around 200 and uh, two, sorry 2,050 uh, uh, represent groups uh, from the diverse uh, women from 27 countries in Asia Pacific. So uh, we are fostering feminist movement in Asia Pacific to influence laws, policies, and practices uh, from the local to international uh, level. And we are also encouraging uh, our members and partners to develop their capacity, produce and disseminate the feminist analysis, uh, and also conduct advocacy and foster uh, networks and spaces for uh, movement building, and also to claim and strengthen uh, the human rights uh, and change for the equality, peace, uh, justice, and development justice. So um, regarding to uh, Pae's uh, questions uh, about the collaborations, the, the potential collaborations that we can develop in the uh, both uh, regions, cross regions uh, in East and Southeast Asia, I think, uh, just like uh, Awigra also has uh, shared before that we have started in, uh, I think in 2019 uh, in Bangkok. Uh, this is the, uh, that was the first uh, step of the collaborations that uh, we've been thinking uh, to, uh, to, to develop uh, also from uh, how, we, how we can uh, start it from uh, identifying the commonalities of the issues that uh, we have been focusing uh, on the migrant workers issues. Uh, so if I can uh, share my uh, quick thoughts about the uh, collaborations um, between both uh, uh, regions, uh, as uh, we have been here from, uh, we have been heard from uh, the first uh, panelists, uh, Andy and also uh, Professor Piper, uh, has shared about uh, what is the challenges, what is the trans issues that uh, migrant workers have been facing uh, even uh, before the pandemic and also the post uh, pandemic and also uh, what we can, uh, I mean, uh, what we can uh, extract from the, from the, uh, uh, from the experience uh, that we've been here, uh, that we've been heard from uh, from the migrant workers itself. Uh, so I think uh, one of the one of the, one of the collaborations that we can uh, explore uh, is how we can support uh, the migrant groups, uh, the migrant worker groups in uh, both in destination country and in origin countries, to have a critical awareness or how who can uh, develop their capacities in advocating their rights. Yeah, and even especially in this pandemic um, that, we've, uh, that we are currently facing and also can be seen uh, from the, can be heard from the points raised uh, by the previous respondents uh, from uh, Fajar and uh, Lenin um, regarding the social protections. So referring to the real and urgent problems uh, that currently faced by uh, the migrant workers group in both countries is uh, specific support in terms of access to health and access to justice and also the security, uh, their, their, their security, I mean, their, their, uh, because many of them has also losing their jobs in this, uh, during this pandemic, no? And this issue has actually been a concern for a long time, but this pandemic has, um, you know, uh, brought this issue uh, to be as a key issue that we must highlight it again in the very first list of our collaborations. 
Yeah, so that's it, uh, Pai. Thank you for the chance. Okay, thank you, Rizka, for your inputs. Yes, uh, so you're underlining the, the, uh, the importance to, to work on the labor conditions, yeah? uh, uh, which is actually uh, endorsing or uh, supporting what uh, uh, Nicolas proposed in the presentation as well. Okay, that's good. Thank you, thank you, Rizka. And I think uh, your, uh, your network in East Asia as well as Southeast Asia and your experience will also be very useful when now we're going to translate that into uh, more action and uh, possibility of engaging uh, the more, more networks uh, in the implementation of that uh, joint advocacy. Okay, any, i like to invite anybody else now to respond so far. We have, I see a hand from Andika Wahab. Yes, Mr. Andika, can you introduce yourself and take, uh, take over the floor? <laughs> it's not a floor, huh? it's the, <laughs> it's always difficult, <laughs> not a floor. <laughs> okay, um, um, Selamat siang, good, good afternoon or good morning. Uh, my name is Andika, I'm currently with the National University uh, Malaysia, UKM. I, I think the same with uh, my colleague from Mindanao. I mean, we, we have been quoting the work from Dr. Nicola. Maybe, maybe, maybe Dr. Nicola didn't aware that she's very famous here <laughs> in our region because people are quoting her work a lot. Um, say, um, uh, Dr. Nicola, you, you actually mentioned about bridging um, between the labor rights and um, you know, climate change or environmental broadly. And I think I, I find it very interesting and emerging as well. But the, the thing is that it, it doesn't reach us yet. So the connection doesn't reach us, um, at least in Malaysian context, we, we can't see that. Yeah. So with that, I think I have three questions uh, with regards to that um, uh, point. Number one is that um, we we aware that each of the, uh, we can call it the world, the world of labor rights, um, group that working on, on migration and human rights and the other world is the world that the people that work in climate change yeah and each of these world has their pool of um, specialists working in that particular area and they have their own pool of resources and each considered themselves as a specialist in their field so this is the matter of fact even even at this platform you you hardly see people with the environmental background joining us because I, I don't think they, they can claim that legitimacy. Um, with that um, um, short narrative, my question is that would they want to sacrifice really their legitimacy in the field, in their respective field and share the resources, including so-called funding because they have their own funding as well. The world in the, uh, the climate change, would, would they want to share that to us? For example, that's one. Number two, the link between uh, la labor rights and climate change to me is, is, is very abstract as at the moment and very illusionary, um, uh, if I may say that. And that does not lead the two, the two world to get together because they can't see the link. We can see the link in, in certain sector like in fishing or maybe in deforestation and forced labor. Uh, for example, in planting in palm oil plantation where people involved in deforestation, that's where the, the uh, issue of forced labor come in. But in other sectors, it's, it's, very, um, it's very abstract. It's, it's difficult to see the link. That's the second question. The third one, is there any concrete example in uh, somewhere else, maybe not in our region, of collaboration between the two where they can actually uh, you know, um, um, uh, disregard my two questions earlier. So basically they can actually work together. They can share resources and all that if there is such a uh, thing happening somewhere else. So that's for Dr. Nicola. But I think the other one, um, specifically for the group, for the next um, few hours, including tomorrow, maybe also um, the space that I think we should also look at the role of business, because uh, to my to our um, engagement so far in Malaysia, we, we have actually seen companies that actually wanting to make changes, whether that changes is genuine or maybe because they want to uh, comply with legal requirement or maybe because of certification sustainability standards or maybe because they want to access new market. We don't know the reason, but we know for a fact that there are companies wanting to make changes, including the uh, improving the um, migration or uh, uh, the hiring system of their migrant workers. 
and how can we bring these um, companies into the equation? And the last one would be, I, I, I strongly believe that when we engage the, um, the private sector, that will also open up the fun flooding gate into CSO. You know, you can see the narrative for as at the moment, you see a lot of these big, big companies, they have pool of funding, but you know how they, they distribute that funding. They go to the, the third party. They only give the remaining budget to the CSO to do the real work on the ground. So I see, I think we need real engagement, direct engagement with businesses who wanted to make change. And therefore we can we can tap into resources. So that would be very general. Um, um, point. I give it back to Pare Fendi. Thank you, Andika. You have a very specific questions to Nicola Piper. Uh, <clears throat> let me check first. I have Mr. Jotaro on the line. I think may I give first the opportunity to Mr. Jotaro to to uh, share his thoughts mm -hmm. on the matters. Mr. Jotaro, over to you. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. thank you. Yeah, good to see you again. So I see the several also familiar faces. I mean, I'm really happy for that. And um, I'm stimulated by several also comments of the participants, and I'd like to also say something from Japan. Um, COVID-19 pandemic is, uh, of course, crisis. But in terms of the uh, collaboration, I see this is a great chance for Japan. Uh, there are several reasons to uh, support that, that, that this idea. So I had a chance to uh, have a presentation with Sasakawa Peace Foundation the end of January, uh, talking about migration and COVID-19. And uh, after that, so I'm invited by JICA, Japan International Cooperation Agency, uh, to have a talk. And uh, I surprised uh, like many young people trying to go to overseas to give some international cooperation. But of course, it's almost impossible for them to go abroad. Instead, now, so JICA wants to them to work for migrants in Japan. Instead of so do something outside, so they try to let them do something for migrants. And uh, JETRO, this is like an economic organization of Japan. It also now so do the project to how to deliver information to migrants in Japan. Other medical institution also try to how we can prevent the COVID-19 spread to migrant communities. So actually I, I, I was caseworker in the past, but I feel like JICA, JETRO, these kind of international organizations are quite far away from migrants in Japan. But for now, <clears throat> they are starting to work for the migrant. For this uh, joint collaboration, uh, national government is really conservative for now, and immigration is really against government migrant for now. But uh, one hope for Jap in terms of Japan is this kind of international organization wants to do something for migrants. So I'd like to so <coughs> consider possibility to include these organizations to this platform is the uh, inspiration I got from several participants. And the other thing is, uh, this is a, co a collaboration between East Asia and Southeast Asia. But I, I felt uh, like today's majority of participants come from Southeast Asia and it looks East Asia is still weak. However, I know uh, Korea should have very strong uh, network of the civil society organization. And I know my friend tried to come here today but he cannot make it here for now. But uh, hopefully so, I we can involve more East Asian participants here to talk to uh, each other. And uh, you, you mentioned like a CSO makes a subgroups first, then to bring the ideas. And this kind of like a subgroup of the East Asia and the South a a Asia so talk first something, then so combine the idea later, just so works uh, so much. Uh, because I just consider case of Vietnam. I think so, uh, Taiwan, was a major destination in the past. Then Korea becomes a destination, and now Japan becomes a destination. So in terms of the sending organizations, they already experienced three destination countries, and uh, there should be so something so we can discuss together. So I'd like to uh, expand the possibility of the, this uh, collaboration. So some talk be among East Asia also needed is my feelings after hearing your comments. So thank you so much for 
your talk. Thank you, Mr. Jotaro. Thank you for reminding us as well that uh, yeah, apparently our participants here, I mean, at this time, you're right by pointing it out that uh, quite few participants from the East uh, Asia Secret Society group. Thank you for that. And uh, uh, I have, before I give to Nikolai and other panelists, I'd like to invite uh, Ridwan. Can you introduce yourself and uh, offer to you? Yeah. Hello? Yes. Hi, can you hear my voice? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Pak uh, My name is uh, Ridwan Wahyudi. Uh, I work for INVEST, Institute for Education Development, Social and Religious Studies based in Yogyakarta. Uh, I would like to highlight additional issues and challenges on migrant workers' protection uh, as pointed by any. And I think uh, this issue should be overcome uh, together. Uh, it's about recent, recently cases that migrants, particularly women, uh, is targeted by violent extremist group to become the, their member. Uh, I do not talk about uh, its number of cases uh, because uh, we know that it is too small. However, we have to consider the risk and potential issue and a destructive effect on migrant workers' uh, existence if they are recruited by violent extremist group. Even at, at the pandemic, extremist propaganda is uh, growing up currently. Uh, our assessment found that uh, there is a relation between violent extremist group propaganda and mental, mental health of migrants. As we know that uh, migrants always face uh, cultural shock in destination country when everything. Most of migrants uh, become a religion approach as exit strategy to overcome stress at the workplace. We identify that like lack of uh, pre-departure pre process prepared by the government to assess migrant mental health. Uh, as we know that uh, government jargon uh, state by Minister of uh, Manpower uh, each migrant have to uh, prepare their physic and mental before de departing abroad. However, mental assessment for migrant never implemented by the government. So it is only physical medical checkup, not me mental checkup. So uh, we think that mental resiliency contribute uh, to make a migrant workers success at the future. It uh, it talks how to a migrant overcome stress at a uh, workplace and other uh, and other case for example in hong kong uh, correct me if uh, i'm wrong uh, nine suicide case cases among female migrant workers happened until 2018 i think mental preparedness is imaging issue and challenge that should be tackled i think uh, that's all my uh, suggestion uh, bye Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ridwan. You are adding one uh, possible common issues is the threat on violent extremism among the migrants. Uh, thank you for that. I think we take note on that. And I'd like to hear as well, probably the response from the panelists. Uh, may I invite first Nicola to answer the question from Andika. Nicola, please. Yes. Well, thank you so much again for raising these super important points. And um, I totally agree. I mean, this bridging labor rights and climate change issue is sort of underdeveloped. However, one thing I can say, and because I've been mainly following in recent years, the global level discussion, right? So at the UN level. So at the UN level, the migrant rights um, community has very consistently 
built this bridge between labor rights and climate change. And um, I can go back, um, these are uh, also uh, American-based um, uh, activists who are working um, intensively in the interconnection between climate change and labor rights. So I can, um, I personally actually think this is a topic that deserves a separate meeting and it is super important. And given we have uh, colleagues from Sastakava here, this might also be for a foundation, be something to think about in terms of, you know, uh, programming and funding. Because this is, these are, this is one of, the, these are actually the two key challenges as far as the United Nations are concerned. Labor, migration and climate change. And um, what I can say also is whenever there are global meetings purely on climate change and, and talking about climate justice, uh, migrant rights um, organizations have also been participating. And I'm talking obviously mostly New York, Geneva, and obviously organizations that are nearby and can afford being there. But what I'm saying is it's when, as far as the global level is concerned, these connections are made. Now, how intricately this really works out, you know, I, I think that actually still has to be worked through. If, as far as sectors are concerned, it's definitely more than fishing. You know, think of tourism, for example, you know, coastal areas, you know, and how climate change impacts. I mean, it's a vast issue, agriculture and so forth. Uh, it's, it, it, this is really, really big. Um, and I also know the global unions are uh, um, engaging with this issue, but again, I'm not an expert on the climate change. I was actually, I'm just about to develop a research program, a project, um, but I've only just started. Um, but I personally think this is a topic we ought to have a separate meeting on. It's really, really um, important to build these bridges. But I can't say more at this moment in time, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you, Nicola. Uh, maybe I'd like to hear a response from Riris. You want to respond on this, or even from from Riska, you know, about the about this issue, you know, collaboration of the two different network of civil society working on climate justice and uh, civil society working on uh, labor. You know, they are working both at the regional level, global level, and what Nicola has already shared to us, they are a movement of civil society at the global level, but. Uh, then uh, Andika raised question very, very specific on the on the region, more at the in the region, uh, probably more at the local level. It's quite difficult to link that up, and particularly in terms of resources, and in terms of uh, difficulty to to connect, to link the issue climate change and migrants. Can I have a response from uh, from Ina? Uh, sorry, from Amy and from Bariris. Maybe from any, any of you working as an alliance for migrant workers, have you come across with uh, experienced people working on the climate change? And maybe readers can also share, what do you think about this? Please, who will take first? Really? Any or, or any, maybe any, I will fight yeah. any in the readers. Okay? Yeah. Uh, so uh, the climate change is actually a new family of migrants. It was actually declared in 2016 when I spoke at the United Nations uh, that uh, climate change is going to be the new trend of forced migration. And it's not small number, but significant. And slowly it will also continue uh, to, threat, uh, to, to threaten many countries, you know, in Asia in particular. So, so far, uh, the network, for example, uh, I know some network is trying to uh, work on issue of the climate change. Um, uh, I forgot one of the foundation in, in Europe is actually trying to promote the, the, the cooperation of climate change uh, migrants and advocates in the world uh, and, and by, by convincing the UN to really seriously address on this issue. Uh, but so far, I can say there is no much, um, the, the climate migration is not really uh, yet into the contact. I know there are, uh, there are countries like Fiji, for example, who are really fighting for compensation and, you know, uh, redress, you know, from the rich countries, for example. But it is in the context of, um, you know, the, the climate agreement. But in terms of the UN addressing climate migration, I haven't seen any uh, anything in place that is uh, discussed systematically. 
So I know there are several uh, here and there uh, CSO who is trying to initiate some study. Uh, they also want actually the, within the migration context. They, you know, we are also recognizing there is difference in terms of what do we need and what do we want when it comes to economic migrants, refugees, and climate migrants. This is totally different community. Economic migrants is really about labor improvement, you know, uh, uh, you know, right to stay, right to work, you know, and a way to return home. But when it comes to refugee, you cannot say, uh, you know, going home because their home is really completely destroyed, right? And they are, their life is also at stake. But when it comes to climate migrants, it's completely different again. They have no home. But yet living abroad or living in other places is very challenging because they used to be fishermen and now suddenly they have to be workers and they have to be farmers. So within the migration, even within IMA, we are trying to go deeper into what is the need what are the needs of the specific community? So I think if, if everyone within this group is, you know, willing to go deeper into that, I, I mean, uh, as a grassroots uh, alliance, I will really appreciate that. It will also enrich our understanding and in term, uh, uh, for the advocate to also know what particular needs that this uh, grassroots community uh, have to be advocated regionally and internationally. Terima kasih, Pak. Okay. Thank you, uh, thank you, thank you for your uh, feedback. Uh, Riris? Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Pae. Uh, we're talking about multiple global issues, and we're not talking about also multiple, uh, multi level stakeholder, right, Pae? Uh, for me, there are, there are two main things uh, inside this. Uh, these topics, multi uh, global, multi multi global issue and multi multi level uh, 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 actor, is about norms. I think we're talking about norms. Uh, Maeni just mentioned uh, uh, we, uh, what term we use includes different consequences, includes different perspective on how to see the issues. Right, we're talking about climate change. We're talking. Um, uh, there are several norms inside climate. Uh, the the, uh, the concept of uh, uh, climate change. We're talking about migrant. There are different norms. Whether that norms fit into each other, we really need to elaborate inside what it is. Right, and also when we talk about uh, different uh, network at different level, we're talking about. Uh, transnational uh, movement, we're talking about global movement and local movement. Again, we're talking about different norms. Which norms we, 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 uh, we need, we will, we will fight for. It is a global norms, local norms, regional norms. So which one is, uh, will, uh, will we really want to say take side, right? So in this case, um, my approach is always go bottom up go from bottom up. We really need to uh, learn, uh, uh, understand the, no the local norms. We really need to learn really the local issues before then, because we need, because obviously at, at uh, actor at the local level, we need support from regional actor and global actor uh, 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 to, to, if we really want to work on this issue. Then that kind of adjustment, adjustment of norms, right? Well, um, uh, how how to adjust how how to like um, adjust between local norms and regional norms and global norms, right? And so uh, which which approach uh, uh, we need to we need to use? I think at at this point, it is we need to talk about human rights and that the, uh, no uh, we need to talk about uh, human security and that's all, right? So uh, forget about state security forget about the uh, like post colonialism uh, debate between the west and the rest and everything we need to uh, we need to really uh, focus on human security what is good for the people right and that should be our starting point so we, we start from uh, whatever happened uh, uh, in uh, uh, at the grassroots level we, we don't really care about all the narrative all the all the nice uh, what to say uh, uh, concepts about what to say migration and climate change we deal with the real uh, issues uh, considering local uh, norms and then uh, uh, it is the role of civil society to bridge to build the uh, to build the bridge 
between the, what happened at the local and how we need to, uh, how, how, how regional actors and regional norms, and regional institution and global institution can help uh, fix the problem at the local level. Thank you. Thank you, Riris, for that. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I, I would like to apologize looking at the time. I think, <laughs> I think we are really, uh, <clears throat> I've been using our time a bit too much. Uh, according to the plan, we're supposed to close at, uh, uh, but before I close, there, uh, uh, before I close this session and uh, go to the next one, I'd like to invite Daniel, who will also say something on the green, green economy, green, uh, a focus related to the migrants. The green is related to climate and how does it relate? Uh, very short, Daniel, over Thank to you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Let me also introduce that I'm also one of member of Indonesian Green Party. Uh, please put it uh, climate change as, uh, you know, like, a, in a, you know, like our, you know, current challenges and uh, maybe easier for us to look at uh, migrant worker as a labor. So migrant worker also a labor. So then easier for us to really link up with the issue of, 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 of climate change. Like for instance, uh, in, in the Greens, we, we are really, uh, of course, supporting the idea of uh, green economic, green job. So uh, it's, it's, it's really a put a lot of ethics on the way whether we want to exploit our nature or not, you know, using the, 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 the fuel or not, because not a lot of, you know, uh, uh, renewable energy already existed when, you know, we, we can be uh, among labor, but you know, when we also work on the, the issues, when, on, on the employment where it's also extracting the, 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 the re natural resources, there's, it is like non-renewable, non then also it's contributed to the climate change. So I think uh, by this, I'd, I'd like also to bring, this is the, 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 the ethics, right? About the, to, to really promoting a green job and then green economic, also circular economic, but every producing, pro producing, Real, uh, pro, uh, you know, producing really think on the ways at, at the end of the uh, the supply chains. They also have to really think, you know, at the end what kinds of waste they have to really uh, reproduce again. And then also, uh, lastly, thing in the concept of green, if we talk about a migrant worker currently, maybe like the formal representation or just only political representation, but maybe the green is much more farther than that. They also come up with the idea of social ownership. So I think it is can be a solution where not just only the political expression that need to be uh, acknowledged, also accepted, but also uh, in the greens we think about uh, you know share the the ownership among among workers. So basically, green somehow is like a new left. Thank you so much, uh, Para Fendi. All right, thank you, thank you for your contribution. Uh, uh, yes, I have another intervention here, written intervention in the chat from um, Baratno, Arsanti. I think you're also underlining uh, the, the climate refugee context. You know, climate change is now actually identified as key accelerator factor of forced displacement. More displacement happens due to climate induced disaster rather than conflict, both across and within the borders. And climate refugee is unfortunately have not been eligible under international law. So that's an issue that uh, uh, makes things a bit difficult as well in terms of uh, linking up. Uh, so there are some, some challenges. There are some potential, but there are some challenges in linking up the, the climate, uh, civil society working on climate change, eco-justice, you know, I heard the term now, eco-justice, as well as, uh, and the other, on the other side, migrant labor, uh, including, of course, the wider context of migrants includes asylum seeker, refugee, and displaced persons, both internally or uh, forced displaced to uh, other countries. Uh, yes, now it's 10 to five. I would like now to close the session. And by uh, actually, I don't want to take any conclusion, but the points has been very, very much uh, well noted, I think, issues like, universal social security is used, the synergy and cross-sectoral collaborations within Southeast Asia and East Asia, 
the issue on placement and recruitment fees, the issue of uh, uh, working place, labor condition rather than just the migrants. Those are the thematic issue, the common issue that we can discuss in both region. Yeah. And uh, another thing which was not really deeply discussed is very interesting actually. It was raised by any on the fact that migrant workers have no rights to vote. Yeah. Uh, in most of the Southeast Asian countries or East Asian countries. Although the experience in Europe is quite different because uh, there are, there are uh, rights to fold for migrant workers when they're already working more than two, two years or three years, then they have the right to fold. Although at the local level, you know, at the local level because they have a local, local governments as well as the national level. So about that, we didn't discuss it so much. And uh, I would like to thank to all panelists, all speakers and all uh, contributions from the participants on this uh, open forum. And uh, uh, thank you for that. And I'd like to now uh, invite the uh, executive director of Human Rights Working Group to deliver his closing remarks of the session. Over to you, Pa Hafiz. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Pa uh, Rafendi, uh, for your uh, uh, role uh, to facilitate discussion uh, today. Yeah. Uh, thank you also for the uh, Mr. Isu Adachi as uh, Executive Director of uh, Sasakawa Peace Foundation and also our partner Fumiko that uh yeah still consistent uh, support us and uh, uh assist us to to prepare and to conduct this uh, discussion or serious discussion uh yeah for uh, my college my friend uh, the speakers uh, Mbak Eni Lestari from International Migrant Islands uh, uh Professor Nicole Piper from British Academy Global uh yeah uh, Queen Mary University of London and also Mbak Riris from University of Indonesia. I remember I met uh, Mbak Riris in 2010 or 2011 uh, during uh, a research project uh, uh, conducted by uh, HRWG. And also Mbak, uh, uh, and also Mariko, uh, the director of uh, Southeast Asia and East Asia Center that uh, support us in the process of uh, uh, develop, developing a BBC network or BBC platform for the uh, internet uh, campaign. Yeah, uh, my colleague uh, Daniel Awigra from HRWG. Uh, Daniel and Awigra actually a similar uh, person. Uh, uh, so uh, don't be uh, confused, uh, Daniel or Awigra. So that's what person as Mbak Riri said in the presentation. Uh, and also our team uh, from HRWG, Jesse, Ifa, Anissa, Alisa, and others. Yeah, uh, this uh, series discussion actually uh, want to uh, resolve or want to uh, giving the, the 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 stimulation for our uh, movement, our our network related with the our challenge. Uh, so as you know, uh, the challenge of uh, uh, research. Uh, process or study process is how to concrete the result of the research. Uh, how we can uh, concrete uh, the result, the recommendation to the action. And you know also during the COVID-19, we are aware uh, uh, a lot of uh, survey study uh, research conducted by uh, relevant stakeholders, not only in Indonesia, but also in the Southeast Asia, uh, even in the global context. However, uh, HRWG uh, thing, uh, uh, the most important, the purpose of uh, research or study is how we can uh, get or uh, can give, uh, give us a benefit or uh, to resolve the problem, to resolve the situation uh, raised from the research and concrete recommendation in the, in the, in the action. Uh, our today's meeting uh, conducted by HRWG and supported by Sasakawa Peace Foundation today and tomorrow uh, aims to come up with the joint cross-regional agenda advocacy. Uh, based on our previous research, 
based on the, our uh, previous advocacy experience, we can uh, uh, get together uh, uh, regional agenda advocacy or join cross regional agenda advocacy uh, to address uh, current situation uh, during COVID-19 related with the migrant workers. As you know, COVID-19 changed our behavior of work, our network, our advocacy, our daily life. It raised a new challenge for us, but also create a new change for us to remind mutual and person among us, uh, especially through the online platform. Uh, less budget uh, for the activities, but also uh, uh, we are facing new challenge, how we can concrete, how we can coordinate each other during the COVID-19. Uh, during COVID-19 also, you know that the using of internet, uh, uh, internet media, uh, online platform by the world community is increased. And so that related with this situation, actually uh, continuing with the previous, uh, previous plan that we have, uh, especially supported by the Sasakawa Foundation, today workshop that we have already done today and will be continued tomorrow, actually want to increase the accessibility and practical utilizing of the study and the recommendation that we have for advocacy with the popular approaches that we can easy, uh, that can be easily accessed by a uh, larger audience, including migrant workers in the world, or especially in the Asia, East Asia and the Southeast Asia. I thank you for uh, the participant, for the speakers, for, for the my, uh, for my team and also uh, our uh, college, uh, Mariko from the uh, Southeast Asia, uh, Southeast and East Asia Center, and also uh, Mr. Uh, Itsu Adasi and Fumiko from the uh, Sasakawa Office uh, Foundation. Uh, we are looking forward for the constructive uh, participation and discussion for tomorrow's session, and I offer to you, uh, Parafendi and committee. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Pa Hafiz, to have such a good uh, closing remarks. And now uh, we have an MC actually. <laughs> so I give it back to the MC <laughs> and then uh, close the session because I already closed my session, but then Pa Hafiz give it back to me. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for right. um, the, the closing remarks, Mr. And thank you very much for all the participants and attendees that have joined this discussion. Um, lastly, good evening. Thank you. I have a, a short announcement. Of course, thank you so much for everybody who joining us today. But those who are invited by us, I'd like to also a bit, you know, maybe recharge or, or refresh about the, the things that we need to do the tomorrow together. So at least uh, we sent to you earlier about three uh, three issues, yeah, or key questions, or for participant uh, to be at least uh, think and uh, later on we can uh, further discuss, especially about the issues that uh, you currently uh, work on and what kinds of challenging uh, you, you you deal with such issues you you work on, and also and in the second of all the the, the specific target audience. You have, and if uh, we really want to together, really uh, supporting or, or, or developing together the the cross regional cooperation, uh, what kinds of uh, 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 what would you envision for having this uh, such a platform in order to can you know we can really you know uh, uh, share and really strengthening uh, each other's work. Basically, three things that maybe later on uh, tomorrow uh, we further uh, discuss. So I thank you so much and, and see you again. Uh, the committee will send you uh, the, the, the link and so on and so forth. I think it's the same link, but just a reminder for you all. Thank you so much from, from my side. Thanks. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. Tomorrow. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Thank you, Paravendi. Thank, thank you. you. Adasisan, Fumiko, thank and you. everybody. Uh, Sum Sumita. Talk. Oh my goodness, I cannot really mention my name, my friends, you know, everybody. Thank you. Andy, bye. See you tomorrow. Bye. Thank you. See you. Bye. Pa e, I have to pass uh, salam dari Mbak Ani untuk Pak E dari Avi juga.
Oh yeah 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 yeah. Hey. Of course, PCPUI. Yes, PCPUI. Urusan politik internasional. Terima kasih RDI ya, RDI join. Thank you for Miko. Vila, Hi Andy, how are you? I, I'm confused with the schedule. I thought we'll have. Yeah so yeah yeah. We Lot of Filipino finished. coming in ya yeah, earlier, you know. Yeah, my <laughs> students. I, yes, your invited student, most of my students. So that means we're gonna meet tomorrow, not anymore after this, right? So yeah, yeah. Is clear. yeah no. <laughs> Because we extended our time here. It is six o'clock already. <laughs> exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. Thank you, Rafin. Have a good evening. Uh, bye. 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 Okay. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. You wanna say something? No. Um, I will do the recording. I think the recording just uh, stop, Eva. Icha, Eva. Already stop. Yes, yes. It's already stop. Already stop. Not still. Not live anymore in YouTube, right? <laughs> so I'm so sorry. Yeah. Oh, still, still live in YouTube. Yeah. So ask Icha to to stop. Okay. The, the recording. The, the discussion, discussion was so good, you know. <laughs> I thought we have more time, 30 minutes, and I use one hour only for discussion. <laughs> so we miss one hour of closed session. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And nobody stopped good. me. Why? Somebody trying to stop me. Ah, Mariko. So we will wait. Right, right, right. Huh? Thank you, Daniel, and thank you, Paolo. Oh. Indeed, it was a wonderful session. <laughs> thank and, you. Uh, yeah, it's always nice, and uh, I'm looking forward to the tomorrow's discussion. And uh, I, I think I got a lot of hints and uh, clues for uh, next year's uh, activities. So I, I hope the tomorrow discussion will be more. Um, active and uh, we can come up with a concrete action plan for next, uh, I mean, the uh, to, to 2021 uh, activities. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Fumiko. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so thank I'm you. trying to stop, you know, the, the, the YouTube through Ita. No, Ita is, 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 is working to train off, then maybe we can have a, a bit, you know. Uh, Okay, stop the recording. No, I'm not. Uh, no, recording stop, but YouTube doesn't you, stop. You, you, YouTube, 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 YouTube. Ah. So if Ita is coming in again. So very good, yeah, from uh, Professor Nicola, yeah. Yes. This super, you know, like a uh, uh, concise in addressing the. Oh the issues and, and stuff so easier for for me because already addressed uh, a lot of governance you know more not yeah. not really protecting the the, the labor uh, uh, right itself so so wait i think if, if i is getting in so otherwise or i or just close the the, the thing yeah now yeah mm. okay the close we just stop everything yeah now yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah okay bye 